Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Folks are just uh, coming into our virtual meeting room tonight for our 2021 budget consultation uh, here in the East End, Wards 19, Wards 14. Um, and so we're just going to give folks a few minutes to kind of settle in here as, as people come on. But uh, very grateful for everyone joining us tonight. Fantastic. We have big registration for tonight. A lot of folks were interested and, uh, and signed up. We've received, I, I know myself uh, and Councillor Fletcher have received lots of correspondence on your, uh, your feedback, your, your hopes, your aspirations, your priorities for the budget. Uh, we've been reviewing that uh, over the past number of weeks. And, uh, and this meeting this evening is another opportunity for us to connect and engage. Uh, we have our budget chief, Gary Crawford, here on the line as well, uh, who, who really leads this work at City Hall and, uh, you know, has for a number of years and talks to lots of folks across the city about their budget priorities. He will be joining us tonight, as well as Steve Conforti uh, is on the line and will be giving us a pre presentation. He's uh, executive director in our, in our finance division. Uh, we'll be talking us through the nuts and bolts of the budget, and then we'll be getting to your questions. So folks are still kind of logging on here. Uh, and, but I think we will kind of get started. Um, again, it's fantastic to see so much interest in, uh, in the municipal budget process. Um, you know, it can get pretty technical and uh, kind of down in the weeds, but it is important. And the fact that you're here and joining us tonight speaks to, speaks to how much that matters. Um, I would like to start, if, if we can, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, and while we are, of course, meeting virtually this evening, we acknowledge that uh, both wards 14 and 19 exist on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, if you're not in the Zoom call, this is uh, also being streamed and recorded on Facebook. So folks can tune into the Facebook live channel as well. Uh, if that's an easier platform for folks to access, we've got it on Facebook as well. So uh, with those sort of housekeeping uh, notes, uh, we've got a lot of folks on the line tonight. We are going to go through some comments from myself and Councillor Fletch Fletcher and our Budget Chief Gary Crawford, presentation from staff, uh, Steve Conforti. And then we're gonna jump into some of the questions. We had a, a ton of questions submitted in advance. We'll take a look at those uh, sort of thematically and provide some comments. And then we're gonna get to Q&A with you folks on the line. Uh, because of the number of folks that we're expecting have registered tonight, uh, our staff will be muting and unmuting folks to answer their, uh, to ask the questions. Uh, or, you know, maybe there's not a question, maybe there's just feedback that you want us to hear. Uh, we will be doing that. And so if you just select the raise hand function, um, our staff will be tracking uh, folks as they're coming on and we'll try our best to, uh, to get an order paper and get to as many questions as we can in the, uh, the two hours that we have together this evening. Um, to kick it off, my name's Brad Bradford. Uh, if, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, it's great to meet you virtually here. Uh, I am the city councilor for Beaches East York, Ward 19. Uh, and I'm here tonight in two capacities. One is the representative uh, for, for our community, uh, bordered from Coxwell over to Vic Park from the beaches uh, up to Sunrise, uh, but also uh, in my role as vice chair of the city's budget committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the benefits to the new COVID reality is that we've seen, you know, a real engagement, actually, Councillor Fletcher and I and, and, and Councillor Crawford were just talking about that before we opened up the room. Um, we've seen a, a real increase in engagement in these virtual meetings. I think when we're at the East York Civic Center, you know, the crowd turnout might be a third of what we're going to get tonight. So uh, while we still have some work on, on to do on making them accessible to everyone. Um, I think that we've seen a great intent, uh, increase in attendance on these types of forums, which has really helped me in, and probably I'm speaking for a lot of my colleagues in representing the community uh, through some of the most challenging times that we've seen here in Toronto. Your feedback continues to be uh, our guiding light in, in how we make decisions and, and govern ourselves down at City Hall. So uh, big thanks to Councillor Fletcher for co-hosting this with me for the third year in a row now. It's hard to believe this is our third budget cycle, uh, but here we are. And, and of course, uh, our budget chief, Gary Crawford on the line, uh, very busy man these, these days, but uh, always makes time for our friends in East York uh, and, and jumps on the line to, uh, to hear from the residents um, in the community. Uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna speak to you in, in a few minutes. Um, 
I'm going to provide some opening remarks and, and then you're going to hear from our city finance team. And uh, that's a good moment probably to introduce Steve Conforti, uh, the executive director of the city's financial planning department. Um, this gentleman is an absolute force when it comes to all of the, the machinery, the nuts and bolts of the city's budget. There are literally thousands of pieces that go into this and literally billions of dollars. And Steve Conforti is, is the guy who kind of pulls all that together and, and brings something out the other side that we can debate and discuss at council. Um, so huge thanks for, to Steve taking some time out tonight to join us and give us a pleasant presentation. Um, and then at the conclusion of that, uh, myself and Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Crawford will go through the questions. Um, so I, as I said, just off the top for those, we still have people joining. Um, when we get to the Q&A part, you're going to select raise hand. Our staffs are, are on the line here. They're going to compile a speakers list. Uh, we will unmute you um, so that you can ask a question or provide your feedback and then put it back on mute uh, just because we're going to have a lot of folks on the line and we want to make sure a, we get to people uh, so they can ask their questions and B, so we don't have the, the feedback issue that sometimes plagues these, uh, these Zoom calls. Um, if we don't get a chance to get through everyone, uh, you can definitely uh, provide your feedback to my office, email, phone call, whatever, and Councillor Fletcher's as well. Uh, we're always very happy to hear from everyone. So uh, just a couple, couple notes to kick it off. Um, big picture of where we are at in the city's budget process. Um, we're a few weeks into the deliberations. Uh, budget committee has been meeting. Uh, we have done our, uh, what is now virtual meetings across the city. We did two days of consultations, uh, hundreds of deputations, thousands of pieces of correspondence submitted uh, across uh, all of my council colleagues and the mayor's desks. Uh, staff have heard that feedback. They've been involved in that. And city staff actually present recommended budget to, uh, to the city's budget committee based on our current financial position. Um, and at, at budget committee, we've actually spent the last couple of weeks going through that line by line and asking for more information on some of the files and divisions that we were curious about where we had questions. Um, staff go back, they'll write briefing notes. They bring that back to budget committee. They did that uh, last week, I guess, and, and we were able to ask follow-up questions. And then um, we'll be headed to, uh, to council for a special budget meeting later in February where we kind of approve this thing and move it forward. Um, on Thursday, though, the final recommendations of budget committee will be made, and those go off to executive committee. Executive committee is, is chair, chaired by Mayor Tory, and uh, he will review all of those recommendations that come out of the budget committee. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's an opportunity for public input on that February 11th before that whole piece goes to city council for more debate and, uh, and a final decision. So this is a timely meeting, February 1st. Um, it, it's really good that you're all here, nearly 100 folks on the line, which is fantastic uh, because this feedback's important to, to all of us. And I, I'm grateful that you're, that you're joining us. Um, there's gonna be a lot of detail uh, on the budget tonight, but in case you're, uh, you're new or you're curious or it's your first time coming to one of these, um, if the one takeaway that I can leave you with, it's that despite you know, serious, unprecedented financial pressures and challenges uh, that the city is facing as a result of the global pandemic. Uh, somewhere in the order of $1.7 billion budget pressure, um, the city of Toronto is maintaining the city services in this proposed budget, which is no small accomplishment or feat. Uh, we have worked tirelessly with our, uh, with our um, government partners at both the province and the federal government to make that happen. There's still more work to do. We'll talk about that. Uh, and we've also worked really hard internally uh, at the city um, financial planning and budget chief Crawford and others to kind of make that happen. Um, this year's budget is really about responding to uh, the challenges facing Toronto in light of the pandemic. And, you know, if, if you were following sort of the COVID response, it goes back to those 83 recommendations that came out of our Toronto office of uh, rebuild and recovery, which was a report that Sad Rafi had put together this summer uh, with 83 recommendations on how to move the city forward. Um, 40 of those recommendations are currently underway. And I think the way, you know, in my view, when we talk about things that have been going on here in the East End in our community um, and, and across Toronto, really, the pandemic provides us an opportunity to refocus and ask ourselves, what are our priorities as a city? Um, and moving forward, how do we build a more connected, more equitable uh, city of Toronto? 
And uh, I think that the, the budget solidifies the city services that we know are essential. Um, we, you know, we went into the, the, the line by line items and, and uh, staff were able to find $573 million in offsets um, that, uh, that were able to help us close that gap and make sure that we are focused on using every single dollar that we have available to help with our recovery uh, and the supports and services that folks need from the city. And, uh, you know, I think one, one other piece to highlight is that year after year, um, I, I find that city government is, is certainly the, the level of government that is closest to residents' lives. I mean, that we're talking affordable housing, we're talking transit, we're talking small businesses, uh, basic things like, you know, getting the, the streets plowed and your garbage picked up. It has a direct and tangible impact on your lives. And that's why it's, it's so, so important. That's why you're on the line tonight. And yet it is also a government that is least equipped with the tools and the revenue streams uh, to pay for, uh, you know, a myriad of services and a list of services and programs and responsibilities that continues to grow. That's not a COVID thing. That is a, the financial sustainability of municipalities across this country. It is a result of decades and decades of downloading uh, and, and very much reflects our current situation. But the pandemic has put a fine point on those existing financial pressures and challenges and certainly calls on all of us and other levels of government as well to, to you know, take a look at that and look at opportunities for transformation and, and ask ourselves who does what and, and how are we going to pay for it. So I think that's kind of thematically something that is important for us to continue to drive out of our budget to conversation, out of the pandemic and looking ahead, um, an opportunity to put Toronto on, on better financial footing going forward. Um, this budget is about making critical investments in equity in three key areas, uh, community safety, financial supports, and public transit. Um, we're working with our government partners, as I said, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping the trains running and the lights on, so to speak. Um, and they've stepped up where you'll see in this budget that there is a, um, a placeholder for $740 million in safe restart phase two funding uh, to fill some of those major budget shortfalls. Uh, we still have to close that gap and there's intergovernmental work to do there. But, you know, we know the province and the federal government realize the significance of Toronto and, and how important it is to, to make sure that those things continue to happen. And we're hopeful that those dollars will come through. Uh, we've been building a city that responds to the new ways folks are moving around in Toronto. Uh, there's been a huge new support and renewed commitment to active transportation. Uh, there were always people that were very vocal and supportive of that, but I think we've seen opportunities for people to experience in different ways in light of the pandemic. And I suspect that there will be lasting impacts um, and transformations in the way we move around, uh, what mobility means to people, how we how we get from A to B in our neighborhoods, and, and you know, a, a focus on hyperlocal um, in our neighborhoods. And I think that that's here to stay in some respect. Um, we've been funding uh, the backbone of our transit system, buses, surface transit. We always talk about subways. Um, you know, we talk about Smart Track. We talk about Scarborough Southeast subway extensions uh, and LRTs. But, you know, so many of the trips in this city are, in fact, surface transit tri trips. And as you, as you fan out from the core and we look at uh, some of the more disparate parts, the further reaches of our 640 square kilometers in this city, um, a majority of those trips are taken on bus, of course. And a lot of people continue to use bus. It actually had the highest levels of ridership throughout the pandemic. It continues to lead the recovery because frontline workers, you know, they're not just folks who work in the medical sector. You know, it's people who show up for their job every day. And, uh, you know, if you're working in um, food processing or manufacturing um, or even the service sector, th those people are not working from home and they're riding the bus to get to work. So we made some investments and priority on, on that, that front as well. And that needs to continue. Um, there's been a lot of work on supporting our, our local businesses. Uh, Councilor Fletcher and I have been very involved uh, here in the community in the East End, making sure that small businesses, both through advocacy with other levels of government, but even, even things that we can make a little bit simpler for small business uh, here in Toronto, responding to the changes, um, the restrictions, the lockdowns. And you saw programs like Cafe TO and Curb TO really flourish as a lifeline for small businesses this year. And, uh, you know, making major and essential investments to respond to the pandemic uh, with respect to housing, uh, our housing and shelters, public health, um, 
dedicated funds for new alternative community safety responses, uh, community-based anti-violence programs, um, th those things that are so vital to building a, a more just and equitable city. That work is not done. In fact, it is frankly in its infancy and we'll have conversations tonight, I'm sure. And as we go through council about how we can accelerate that, how we can push for more. I know that's been a huge focus of the deputations that we've heard so far across the city. Um, the, po the point there is this work is underway. Um, you know, it, we will never be satisfied with where it is, um, but that work is underway and it continues and we have a plan and, and we definitely need to, uh, to drive that, that stuff forward. So um, I think I'm going to kind of wrap it up there. I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Fletcher, who I know has some, some uh, opening remarks and, uh, and then we'll go to Gary and then Steve. Uh, but again, my thanks for you being there here tonight uh, and looking forward to our conversation. And I'll turn it over to Councillor Fletcher. Thanks, uh, thanks Brad. And I really wanted on behalf of everybody here tonight on this call to congratulate you and Catherine on the arrival of little Briar just last mm. week on the full moon. So very special baby. Uh, congratulations. Your life is now completely changed and it's going to be fantastic. So I think we all just want to give you our very best, Brad, before Thanks we start the much, meeting. Thanks very much, Council. Oops, you're a bit frozen. Fletcher, you'll, you, you called yeah. it, uh, Council. <laughs> and, uh, and I would have her here, but like the idea of a municipal finance discussion actually put her to sleep. So uh, she's not going to be with us. <laughs> well, let's hope, she's, let's hope she's the only one that's falling asleep with this tonight. Nobody online is. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. When we're at East York, you know, we have some lovely little snacks from the community. So sorry, no great treats for you. You'll have to supply your own. I also just want to say uh, I hope everybody's doing all right under COVID. I think it's extremely difficult for so many people. Our homes, which we like to retreat to, are now our office and also the school. So three in one, and we're on these Zoom calls all the time, all day long, and it's very trying, and we don't get to see all the people we love. So I hope you're all well. I hope your families are well and that you're all doing okay during the pandemic. Um, and always, you know, you can reach out to our offices if there's anything that you need or you know somebody who does need something. I want to also say uh, I am joined here by these heavy hitters. I mean, Brad's the vice chair, Gary's the chair, and Stephen Quinforti does the whole budget. So I, um, I'm not the expert on the budget. I just know the things that I think are important in the budget and I think I want to tell you what's important to me in the budget and I know tonight we're going to hear from you about what you would like us to focus on in the budget and a whole number of questions and I think Brad's been absolutely right there's never been a time like this we've never lived through anything like this and it has had a tremendous impact on the city and on the finances and we have left this placeholder imagine a placeholder for 700 and some million dollars that we're waiting for from the other levels of government in order to maintain the service levels that we have, service levels that some of you think we should be doing more of and you'd like us to do more and different things and service levels for some of you where you think that we have too much service or the budgets are too big. And that's our dialogue, that's our democracy, that's our great community where we're sharing all of these things. But I wanted to share with you what I think are some really key issues here during the pandemic that are big issues for me. And I think in our community, they are as well. I know that anti-Black racism is a very big issue for everyone. And it is Black History Month. And I think we will be noting that in very many special ways this month. As you know, this past year, we had nooses at Michael Guerin Hospital um, on the job site, on the rebuild, and our community simply stood up very strong. Thankfully, the perpetrators were found and an end has been put to that on this job site and others. But it really, along with the defund the police, showed the incredible passion and 
import to so many East Enders of anti-Black racism. And we do have to honor that in our budget and our everyday work and through Black History Month, but every month of the year. For me, housing is a very big issue. I um, very much support all of the difficult moves that we've made even during the pandemic. And I know, I think today or yesterday, we started seeing the pictures of the modular housing that was, we fast-tracked that, like we've never fast-tracked anything else to get that built, to get people moving into absolutely beautiful little homes. There are more coming. We have some coming in the East End. We cannot do that fast enough. I'm totally committed to that part of our spending. Also money for tenant supporting tenants and protecting tenants. Hopefully we will be able to assist in more dollars for the um, tenant protection. So many people are unable to pay the rent. We've seen some of the evictions. We've seen those proceed with evictions even during the moratorium and also for rent safe to get that moving faster, get that moving um, uh, up, up and implemented quickly. So I am for that type of spending, including for MLS to get the enforcement for Airbnb, just moving faster. So my, uh, if, if we're too slow, we're going to miss the moment for some of this critical spending for those who need it. Obviously, climate is always an issue. I know that many of you think we're not funding Transform TO to the amount that we should. Let's try to make sure that we are transforming our city from a climate point of view, and we are putting the valuable dollars there. I know many of you are very concerned about childcare. It is taking a beating under the pandemic, absolute beating. And we know that some childcare centers have closed. We also know that women's participation in the workforce is plummeting. It's getting lower during the pandemic. And one of the most important things to having equity, to having equality, is ensuring that there is childcare and women who still are primary caregivers can get out to work. So the childcare matter is a really critical one right at the moment. And I'm glad, Brad, that you talked about transit because it is very important uh, and realizing that we have to plan for the future in transit, whether we're buying buses, more streetcars. Uh, Metrolinx has taken over a lot, of, a lot of the transit, but still the surface transit, the buses, the suburban transit, the streetcars, they're still very much the TTC under the TTC purview. And uh, I know that our budget committee is thinking about that as is the TTC. So those are some of the things that I think are, for me, really critical that I'm gonna be fighting for and voting for in this budget. And I just want to thank you again for being here. And I'm going to turn it over now to Gary Crawford, Councillor Gary Crawford, who is the budget chief. He's been that for a while and he continues on. Thank you, Gary, for your work and leading that work at the city. And please uh, welcome to our, to our East End budget forum. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paula. And, and I, and I think everybody, a lot of people on this uh, call can, uh, consider you a heavy hitter at, at City Council too. Oh. So you, I've known you a long time and, and, and you, you, we all hold you in highest esteem uh, at uh, Council. And of course, Brad, I would be the vice chair and working uh, diligently over the last number of months. And again, just want to welcome everybody and thank you. Um, I always look forward to coming out to East York. Uh, it's been the last three years, I believe, I've been out. Uh, physically, of course, uh, into the chambers and, and having an opportunity to speak, unfortunately. Uh, it's, a, it's virtual this year, but again, it's still an opportunity for, for me um, and all of us, really, um, who will be making the decisions on the budget to come to listen to you and have a conversation about your priorities, your concerns, and, and all of that. I think it's, it's always helpful. We have just come out of Brad and I um, public consultations down at City Hall last week where we heard uh, from residents all across the city, virtually, of course. And as I said, it's important that we get out and listen to you what your priorities are because the decisions that we make on your behalf have an impact to you, to your neighbors, to the community, to the entire city. 
Um, and we do our best to ensure that we do what you want us to do, uh, but recognizing um, the system can be uh, quite lengthy um, and we don't always agree on everything, but I think it's important that we get out and listen. I think that's what me as a budget chief have, has recognized that and I continue to do that. Um, I've been, uh, this is my seventh year as the budget chief for the city of Toronto. And as Brad has mentioned, um, this has been the most challenging budget um, I have ever experienced. And I think many at city hall um, have ever experienced, uh, again, due to the uh, worldwide pandemic that we've been facing. Um, and our staff, our staff, and you'll hear from Steve in a second here from financial planning, um, have been in many ways the heroes of the last year where not only were they putting together a 2021 budget, but they were working incredibly hard behind the scenes, just managing 2020. Um, and when you're looking at the, the, the services and, and the challenges that we had uh, all across the city, um, and the work that they have done is just, um, as I said, I, I look at them as the real heroes, really trying to maintain the services under extreme circumstances. Um, and Steve and his team just trying to manage the finances of the city. And again, they, they did that, uh, you know, we, we did manage to, uh, to get through 2020. Um, it wasn't easy, fine, this is just financially. Um, we did um, need support from the other uh, two levels of government. And again, we're looking at that partnership with the two levels in the 2021 budget. Um, but this really is, uh, it's a COVID uh, responsive budget. Um, and we're really looking at, when I say COVID responsive, it's really uh, some key pivotal aspects of that in, is really looking at number one, trying to maintain the services um, that everyone, all of you uh, here and across the city expect from us and expect from the city. Um, and we, we, uh, we have done that. It has been challenging, no doubt, because there are a number of services that may not have been where they, we would want them, um, depending on whether it's through parks or other areas of the city. Um, but we have been able to maintain as best as possible. And I think in the 2021 budget, um, we, we looked at and staff looked at to maintain services. There are no cuts in this budget at all. There are some areas that may not be up to where they need to be in 2021 because we're still looking at a number of health concerns and health, health issues. Um, but the goal is to get back up to the, the service levels that we expect. And again, we're also looking at keeping our capital projects on track. Um, in this budget, there is uh, $856 million that we are um, relying on the other two levels of government to make us whole. And that really impacts our, our capital side in the event that we don't get this money but i'm confident we do it could potentially impact our capital uh, our capital uh, uh project so we want to ensure that we maintain that and i think this budget does that um but what it also does is it said it maintains services there are some enhancements in in the um the budget uh not as much as in other years um but we we really looked at where are where is the need across the city we're going to hear from some of you tonight on where that need is but when we're looking at areas like shelters and supportive housing and Toronto community housing. Um, Toronto Public Health, of course, uh, their budget for next year's budget as one example is $59 million uh, more for public health. Um, and it's totally justifiable under, under the circumstances of the pandemic. Uh, there's more money in this budget for seniors and, and long-term care. Um, so staff and, and staff, Steve will go through a number of the, um, the, the, the specifics of trying to look at where the need is and we do need to invest. And I think we have invested in that. Um, and that's, you know, other than, you know, trying to maintain services, um, keeping, um, you, you know, keeping it affordable, keeping this budget affordable for the residents in the city. Part of the tour, which is the Toronto Office of uh, Rebuild and Recovery, uh, did a huge amount of consultation across the city. And one of the things they heard overwhelmingly um, with the challenges we've had with the pandemic over the year, people want to keep this city affordable. So I think this budget um, is an example of that. Uh, but again, this is a budget process. We are now in the, the point where we're listening to you. Um, we'll be going to, as Brad mentioned, uh, to budget this Thursday. We will finalize the budget recommendations, goes to executive the week after, and then the week after that, full council for debate. Um, but this really is our opportunity to listen to you. Um, and you know, after Steve's presentation, I'm more than willing to answer questions along with uh, Councillor Fletcher and of course Bradford. And again, looking forward to a uh, fruitful conversation with everybody. So. Fantastic. I think Brad, over to you. Yeah, and thanks very much, Gary. Um, great, great uh, <laughs> opening remarks. And I think we have the, the table set now for the big show. Um, Steve Conforti has a, has a very comprehensive presentation that he's going to kind of take us through here and give you a sense of uh, how the budget works on both the operating and the capital side. 
where the challenges are, the moves that we've made to address that and, and the investments that we're going to be making in the year ahead. Um, and then from there, we'll be able to go into the, the Q&A portion and, and have that conversation and, and hear from you folks on the line. So with that, uh, Steve, we'll get your screen up. Uh, and if you could kind of walk us through how you put together the 2021 budget, uh, no small feat, uh, but uh, very interesting nonetheless. And I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Great. Thanks very much. So um, good evening. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Councillors Bradford and Fletcher uh, and their staff for organizing this consultation on the 2021 budget, um, as well as everyone attending for your interest and participation in the city's budget. So as mentioned, my name is Steve Conforti. I'm the Executive Director of Financial Planning at the City of Toronto um, and responsible for leading the development of the city's $14 billion operating budget and uh, $45 billion 10-year capital plan. 2021 has been a challenging budget and staff across all city division and agencies have worked tirelessly to produce and deliver a balanced budget. When we put together last year's budget, we could not have imagined the change in circumstances that would be before us a year later. While the budget must account for the impacts of the pandemic that we've experienced, it must also account for challenges ahead of us, which we have no playbook or off the shelf answer. This is not just about weathering the storm or waiting for things to go back to normal, now that so many of our lives have been so fundamentally changed. The budget will touch on four areas. Um, one, how COVID-19 has touched every aspect of our lives and how our city has responded to the unprecedented challenges and financial impacts. Uh, two, how we must all work together towards recovery, institutions, community, and governments in a whole of government and whole of community approach. Um, three details on the 2021 operating budget, including work being done on driving equity-based budgeting at the city. And lastly, the capital budget, including key investments to protect the city's future. Next slide. Well, we acknowledge and appreciate that all governments, including the province and federal governments, have responded to the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19. We know there's more to be done together. The city faces increased financial risks. In addition to lost revenues, we've experienced significant increased costs for the resources required to support new services and programs that have been implemented in response to the pandemic. Uh, these have included significant investments to shelters, agencies, support to local business, and maintaining transit capacity while experiencing a critical reduction in fare paying riders. COVID-19 related financial impacts were over $1.7 billion for the city in the year 2020 prior to savings and offsets and funding under the Safe Restart Agreement. The city has and will continue to be looking for savings and efficiencies as we face unprecedented financial challenges. Mitigation strategies for 2020 included 534 million in cost savings from a combination of workforce restraints, spending constraints and cost avoidance, including staff placed on emergency leave, decreased TTC operating costs and matching service capacity to demand. Federal provincial funding support was also provided in 2020 as part of the Safe Restart Agreement. COVID-19 financial impacts will continue into 2021 and are currently expected to total nearly $1.6 billion. The city has received $740 million from the Safe Restart Agreement funding for 2021 so far to offset some of these impacts, leaving a potential opening gap of $856 million. The pandemic has exasperated the city's structural financial challenges, especially the misalignment of revenue and responsibilities. The city has already made difficult decisions about costs, services, service levels, capital projects, and placing staff on emergency leave. If we do not address our structural financial gap now, we will be faced with ongoing budget pressures between one and a half to two billion each year, and that's just not sustainable. The city is continuing to engage with other orders of government on securing 2021 funding to offset ongoing financial impacts arising from the pandemic. But without a change framework through agreement with other governments or revenues that match Toronto's responsibilities, we will be forced to make very difficult decisions that can have further negative impacts on our residents. Next slide. So for context, the city's overall combined operating budget totals just under 14 billion and the city's 10 year combined capital plan is just under $45 billion. Uh, this includes both our tax and rate supported programs with our rate supported programs, including Toronto Water, Solid Waste, and the Parking Authority having been approved in December of 2020. Next slide. And next slide again, please. So we establish a set of guiding principles to prepare a staff recommended budget. First principle is managing COVID demands for city services and the impact COVID is having on our city. 
Second, the budget is set to preserve existing service levels while needing to account for public health guidelines. We have prepared a budget that promotes tax affordability given the economic impact COVID has had. And lastly, COVID-19 has highlighted social and health inequities amongst Torontonians. We have experienced success in working with the Government of Canada, uh, Province of Ontario, and community partners to address these inequities. The budget highlights investments in areas that will help build back a stronger Toronto. Next slide. Of the nearly $14 billion operating budget, $12.09 billion reflects the tax-supported budget that will be the focus of the presentation. As noted, the rate-supported budgets uh, were approved this past December. The 2021 balanced operating budget does assume continued funding support of $1.6 billion from the Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario to address COVID-19 impacts. This is consistent with 2020, where the city successfully received $1.2 billion in safe restart funding to fully offset 2020 COVID impacts. For 2021, the city was able to offset growth and inflationary pressures through $573 million in savings and offsets. This included a salary freeze for non-union staff, voluntary separation program, impacts in aligning uh, actual spending to trends. Um, in keeping with the feedback we received from residents as part of the TOR report, we are including an affordable tax increase of 0.7%, reflecting the rate of inflation. As noted, the budget expects 1.6 billion in continued COVID funding from the federal and provincial government with 740 million secured to date. Consistent with our guiding principles, the budget preserves existing service levels albeit consistent with health guidelines. We are recommending an affordable tax increase of 0.7%, reflecting the rate of inflation. Um, but there is also 56 million in new investments, which include expansion to current programs, continuation Oops. enhancements made in previous years, investments to address inequities highlighted by the pandemic and modernization initiatives. Some examples of equity initiatives include housing now initiatives, transit fair pass program expansion, increasing eligibility, and community-based safety initiatives. Next slide. So this is an interesting slide that helps demonstrate the impact of COVID-19 on the city's finance. The chart captures the city's opening budget pressure from 2014 to 2021, reflecting growth and inflationary pressures that generally drive change in the budget. Beginning in 2020, you notice that the impacts of COVID-19 reflecting an added pressure of $1.7 billion. We have been successful in managing the COVID pressure in 2020 through over 500 million from actions taken by the city um, to reduce costs and find offsets, as well as 1.2 billion from the Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario. 2021 again includes COVID pressures now expected to be 1.6 billion, in addition to growth and inflationary pressures of 650 million for a total 2021 opening budget pressure of $2.2 billion. Next slide. So I'd like to share our roadmap to balancing the 2021 budget. As mentioned, we have been able to identify 573 million in offsets through, uh, through city-led mitigation strategy. This has enabled us to absorb our own growth and inflationary pressures and demands. And again, the budget does assume continued federal and provincial support of 1.6 billion of COVID pressure, as well as 61 million refugee response costs and 15 million in support of housing, totaling 1.7 billion. Of the 1.7 billion of federal and provincial support, 740 million has been secured. Next slide. The expected 1.7 billion in continued financial support is broken down as follows. 1.6 billion to address COVID impacts. The lost revenue in the TTC is a major component of our ask at 796 million. This lost revenue is triggered by the reduction in transit ridership. Our corporate revenues are also impacted, such as reduced dividends from Toronto Parking Authority and Toronto Hydro, reduced user fees, and a reduction in MLTT revenue. Not surprisingly, we expect increased public health costs to address the pandemic. We have additional COVID shelter costs of $281 million. We have an increased need in our shelters to accommodate additional shelter sites, uh, enabling social distancing requirements to be met. We also have increased cleaning costs and PPE costs due to the pandemic at uh, Toronto Community Housing and in our long-term care facilities, as well as $125 million in costs across all remaining city services. In addition to COVID funding and similar to how we approached the last two budgets, the city expects it will continue to be supported by the Government of Canada for refugee response costs of up to $61 million. And we also require funding supports from the province of Ontario for supportive housing. Next slide. 
this slide shows how our operating budget is funded and where we spend that funding. In terms of where does the revenue come from, um, the slide reflects uh, where revenues are coming from, but also highlights uh, where we anticipate to have lost revenues due to COVID. 37.1% of our revenue comes from property tax. For 2021, property tax revenue totals $4.5 billion. Federal and provincial funding represents 34% of the city's overall revenue and reflects $2.5 billion in cost-shared programs, grants, and subsidies, including $61 million for refugees uh, and $15 million for supportive housing. This year, the city has also requested $1.6 billion in federal and provincial funding to offset COVID impacts. You'll notice that the majority of our remaining funding sources reflect a loss from prior years due to the impact of COVID-19. For user fees, the city collects approximately $700 million in user fee revenue, um, uh, as well as fine revenue, uh, which is also down due to COVID-19. Land transfer tax is budgeted at $700 million. And other revenue includes uh, reduced dividends from Toronto Hydro and Toronto Parking Authority, in addition to anticipated lost parking enforcement revenue, to highlight a few. DTC fares will make up $500 million in revenue, with a revenue loss of over $700 million due to decrease in ridership. The remainder of revenues are from investment income and transfers from capital and reserves, which are unaffected by the pandemic. In terms of where does the money go, $3.6 billion is spent on our cost-shared social programs, such as children's services, long-term care homes, and public health. $2.15 billion will be spent on the TTC. $2 billion is spent on emergency services, including fire services, Toronto paramedic services, and Toronto police service. $1.1 billion in corporate and capital financing costs represents our capital from current contribution and our debt servicing requirements supporting our capital investments. $1 billion will be spent on other city operations, such as affordable housing, city planning, court services, economic development and culture, municipal licensing and standards, and parks, forestry, and recreation. Governance and corporate services of $800 million includes enabling frontline services, such as 311, Auditor General, the City Manager's Office, and facilities, real estate, and environment and energy. Corporate accounts represent expenses incurred on behalf of the entire organization. Uh, an example would include insurance and employee-related liabilities. And finally, transportation and other agencies total $800 million combined. Next slide. As mentioned, the principle in our budget was to preserve existing services. $11.7 billion is allocated to preserve these service levels based on assumptions that are consistent with public health guidelines. A further $1.6 billion is invested for the continued COVID response. Next slide. Even with the significant uh, challenges we face in responding to COVID, we have dedicated $22 million in new and enhanced programs that will build a prosperous Toronto. Approximately 12 million is dedicated to equity responsive investments that includes Housing Now Initiative, expansion of the Transit Fair Pass program eligibility, community-based crisis response pilot, enhancement to the wards, uh, the Towards Peace program. Uh, the city is also continuing to support Cafe TO and Active TO programs, which were introduced in response to COVID. With our transit system, we are making investments to reduce wheel trans call wait times and promote anti-racism and diversity. In addition, we're investing 34 million in areas to support and prepare the city to build back stronger. Protecting and securing our assets is an area of focus, along with the investment, uh, along with this investment in technology tools necessary to, pro to provide services in a contactless environment. We are also making investments to prepare for the opening of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT in 2022 and on TTC vehicle maintenance and improving vehicle reliability. The budget enhances the commitment in Vision Zero and funding for traffic signals and work zone pilots. And lastly, we are fulfilling a commitment to investing in the year of public art. Next slide. As we look beyond 2021, there is uncertainty surrounding the city's COVID response requirements, public health measures, service resumption, uh, and the extent of federal and provincial funding support. We are assuming a range for potential pressures and demands on the city's operating budget in 2022 of anywhere between $1.1 to $1.8 billion. We will continue to monitor COVID impacts and supports throughout 2021 and update our assumptions accordingly, as well as continue to work with the Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario to determine the necessary funding support to address the unprecedented pressure that the city is continuing to face. Next slide.
The City of Toronto's residential tax increase is 0.7% in line with inflation. Consistent with Council policy, the commercial and industrial rate increases are a fraction of the residential rate. This helps to bring the business class tax rate down to levels consistent with provincial legislation and Council policy by the year 2023. There is no increase in multi-residential properties in compliance with provincial legislation. In total, this translates to an average tax increase of $22 for the average home. Next slide. As approved in 2019, there is an incremental increase in the city building fund of 1.5%. This dedicated levy leverages $7.3 billion in housing and transit inv infrastructure investments. This increase represents a further $47 the average tax bill. Next slide. For an average home valued at $698,000, the average property tax bill will be $3,201. This slide demonstrates how an average property tax amount will be spent. And as you can see, 67% of the average tax bill is spent on keeping our city safe, moving, maintained, and growing. Next slide. So moving to capital, the 10-year capital budget and plan um, guides decisions on what investments will be made towards purchase, build, and repair of city infrastructure. The city's 10-year capital plan totals just under $45 billion when you combine the tax and rate supported budgets. This presentation will focus on the 10-year capital plan of just over $29 billion for the tax supported programs only. Again, as the rate budgets, which include Toronto Water, Solid Waste, and the Parking Authority, were approved by Council in December. Consistent with the operating budget, four guiding principles were applied during the development of the capital plan. First, the capital plan continues to build upon investments committed to as part of the 2020 budget process, which included significant increases in state of good repair funding for transit and housing, as well as other capital priorities. There are also new investments being recommended within this year's capital plan, again for transit and housing, but also for environment and modernization initiatives. Second, I spoke to the importance of our partnership with the Government of Canada and Province of Ontario, and the capital plan reflects these valued partnerships to fund vital programs and services. In total, $4.8 billion in federal provincial funding will continue to be leveraged for investments in key areas such as mobility and housing. Third, the budget is focused on a capital plan that is both achievable and affordable. Planning of capital projects includes a lens on what can be delivered within budgeted timeframes. And lastly, the city continues its capital modernization efforts with a key focus over the next year towards the development of a capital asset management plan. Next slide. So how do we better execute a capital plan that is both achievable and affordable? So first, we remain committed to improving capital spend rates. Our capital planning process looks to ensure that capital projects are budgeted when they are construction ready. This will ensure that available capital funding is allocated to both where it is needed as well as where it can be spent. Two, we are continuing to expand the implementation of stage gating across the entire organization. Uh, as a city, we are committed to keeping our debt service ratio below 15% in each year of the 10 year planning period. The capital plan continues to leverage federal provincial funding that accounts for approximately 16% of the total capital plan. We've been able to benefit from low interest rates with overall debt funding increasing compared to last year's plan while continuing to adhere to our debt service ratio. The funding increase has been further supported through our success in issuing both social and green bonds to, the finance, to finance capital infrastructure. We have now issued three green bonds and we are the first Canadian government to issue a social bond. We plan to issue both green and social bonds in 2021. The focus on achievability and affordability builds on actions that began as part of last year's budget process. We've seen positive results arising from these changes in capital planning. Even in the midst of COVID-19 and the related impacts on capital delivery, we've seen material improvements in our capital spend rates, projected at 81% in 2020 compared to an average of 62.5% in prior years. Next slide. <clears throat> the budget continues to build on the success achieved as part of the 2020 budget process and through the planned continued 1.5% increase in the city building fund. Through the City Building Fund, we can support $7.3 billion in funding for critical capital investments in transit and housing. This now represents the city's largest source of capital funding, reflecting a quarter of the city's total capital program. This budget also continues with our planned investment in TCHC building repair. The capital plan continues with the $1.6 billion in funding added last year for TCHC needs and also extends the support by an added year 
with a further 160 million investment plan in 2030. As reflected in last year's plan, this continued commitment enables the city to leverage a further 1.3 billion in co-investment through, through our federal partnerships. We've also been able to build on the advancements introduced last year, and the current capital plan has increased by over $1.1 billion in funding when compared to our previous 10-year plan. This increase has enabled the city to make added investments in areas such as mobility, with $215 million in added investments in base transit needs. Um, the budget also includes an acceleration of nearly $800 million in funding into the first five years of the capital plan to address these needs faster. We have also added a further $83 million towards maintenance of city bridges and $39 million as part of Move TO. With regards to housing, in addition to the further $160 million investment in TCHC building repair, the budget includes $329 million in added federal, provincial, and city funding towards housing. For the environment, this capital plan includes an added $193 million in investments that support climate change emergency. And with modernization, $226 million has also been added for the design and implementation of Modern TO's Workplace Modernization Program, as well as technology investments increasing access to city services. The capital plan continues to incorporate federal provincial funding, and we have added further funding for housing initiatives, as well as funds provided through the COVID resilience stream. Lastly, the capital plan is balanced and affordable. For the second year in a row, we have maintained our debt service ratio under 15% for all years within our 10-year planning period, and we have included an inflationary increase to our level of capital from current funding. That said, support from the Government of Canada and Province of Ontario continues to be critical to offset COVID impacts on the city's operating budget. In the event that adequate funding is not forthcoming in 2021, material adjustments to the capital budget will be required through a reduction in planned CFC funding. Next slide. As mentioned, the tax supported capital budget totals just over 29 billion over the 10 year planning period and will guide decisions on what investments will be made to purchase, build and repair city infrastructure. Looking at how the money is invested in the capital plan, first I'd like to draw your attention to the 13.3 billion investment in transit. This represents 46% of our total capital program and builds on investments committed to last year that nearly doubled our historical investment in funding towards transit SOGR. The city is also committed to spending 2.9 billion in housing, coupled with a further 4.4 billion investments through foregone revenue in the form of land value and financial incentives. This funding will be used to support the development of 20,000 affordable homes and will move the city towards the goal of supporting 40,000 new affordable houses under the Housing TO 2020-2030 Action Plan. To create the remaining 20,000 new affordable homes, we will require added investment from the federal and provincial governments. We are also investing a further 5.2 billion in transportation, 3.2 billion in the environment, uh, which includes initiatives within parks, environment and energy, as well as the TRCA, and 4.5 billion across all other city programs and agencies, such as real estate, emergency services, library and technology services. The left side of the chart details how the capital plan is funded. The city building fund now reflects our largest source of capital funding at 25% and is applied against transit and housing initiatives. Debt funding totals 6.6 .6 billion and benefits from lower interest rates in 2021 and the use of green and social bonds. There's a further 3.7 billion in capital from current funding reflecting direct funding from the operating budget to support capital investment. Remaining funding comes from the federal and provincial government, capital reserves and recoverable debt for projects that will return to savings or an added revenue such as our building retrofit program. Next slide. State of good repair funding traditionally reflects the majority of the capital spending within our 10 year capital. Even with the level of SOGR funding and future year commitments, staff continue to project an SOGR backlog that will grow over the next 10 years from 6.9 billion to $14.8 billion. The growth arises from the current age of city infrastructure and the SOGR impact of added capital needs, uh, primarily identified through the TTC's capital investment plan with future vehicle needs alone reflecting two thirds of the TTC backlog. Addressing the SOGR backlog is a key capital priority. From 2015 to 2019, the city spent $7.2 billion on SOGR that was used to address infrastructure needs across key areas such as transit, housing, libraries, arenas, and community centers. As part of the 2020 capital budget process, significant gains were made towards addressing the city's SOGR backlog. The infusion of incremental capital funding through the enhancement to, this to the city building fund 
enabled the city to nearly double our investment in TTC base capital needs, increasing our 10 year investment from over 6 billion to just under $12 billion. The 2020, in 2020, the city also committed uh, to 1.6 billion in funding towards TCHC building repairs that enabled us to leverage a further 1.3 billion co-investment from the government of Canada. The 2021 capital plan continues to advance commitments made as part of last year's process. A total of 16.1 billion will be invested in SOGR over the next 10 years. This includes continued and advanced commitments in transit and TCHC, as well as makes further investments in funding towards infrastructure such as city bridges. Moving forward, staff will continue to explore and identify opportunities to further address infrastructure needs. We will also leverage the work to be done uh, to be completed on asset management planning to ensure a consistent approach across all city programs that will ultimately provide a uniform strategic lens on how we invest in capital infrastructure across the organization. Next slide. We have both added and accelerated funding to this year's capital plan. Similar to the operating budget, there has been a focus on equity within many of our added capital investments. Within mobility, an additional $244 million in funding for easier access will address accessibility of Warden and Islington stations and ensure all TTC stations are accessible. We are investing a further $489 million through the federal, provincial, and city funding on housing initiatives, including investments in housing now, modular housing, rental housing, and the rapid housing initiative. Further investments are also being made in community initiatives, such as the Parkdale Hub project. Added investments are being made in modernization and transformation, including 226 million uh, for a workplace modernization program, which will unlock value in eight city properties that can be leveraged for affordable housing and other city needs. And lastly, investments are being made towards the climate change emergency, with 193 million in added investments in sustainable energy plans building retrofits, and the Renewable Thermal Energy Program. Next slide. And next slide again. Next. Uh, this has been a challenging budget shaped by the impacts of COVID-19. We've seen added costs to, look, to deliver services in a safe manner. While revenue sources traditionally leveraged to offset inflationary and growth costs are expected to decline. One of the key principles of our budget was to manage the COVID impacts while also preserving existing services consistent with public health guidelines. There is also a recommendation for further 56 million in new investments focused on equity and building a prosperous Toronto. All of this is achieved while keeping our property taxes affordable. The capital budget reflects the increased city building levy, which enables us to further advance our commitments towards transit and housing infrastructure demands. We expect continued federal and provincial support to offset COVID impacts. However, we do have a strategy to keep the budget balanced if this funding is not received. The options available to us are not our preference and it would materially impact our capital plan and reserves. We are optimistic we will continue to build on the 2020 collaborative success with both the Government of Canada and the province of Ontario to secure a sustainable financial future. Next slide. So this slide presents the budget schedule for 2021. Um, I've been able to provide, uh, to present an overview of the city's budget However, detailed materials by program or agency can be found on the city's budget website. Uh, we're nearing the end of the first phase of this year's budget process. We had the opportunity to hear from the public on January 25th and 26th, and this will be factored into considerations of the budget by budget committee uh, next week uh, when budget committee has its final wrap up. From there, the budget will be voted on by the city's executive committee and then ultimately by city council on February 18th. Thank you, everyone. That's fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that, Steve. Uh, very thorough overview. And I think that's a, that's a great uh, point for us to kind of kick off uh, our discussion tonight with, uh, with myself and uh, Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Crawford. A um, lot of work goes into uh, putting all that stuff together there, Steve. And I know that uh, for a lot of us, budget season is kind of you know, the new year and into February as we go through the consultation, but you and your team work hard at that uh, for many months of the year. And certainly I think what we can all take away from that presentation is uh, despite the magnitude of the challenges facing the city of Toronto uh, this year more than ever, um, you know, you've been able to, uh, to deliver a lot of key services and programs um, that Torontonians are expecting and depend on. So uh, no easy task and, and we'll get into that discussion now. So uh, again, just as a reminder for folks, 
we are going to uh, we're going to pull people off mute. If you use the raise hand function, uh, I'm going to be writing down a list, uh, and then we'll call on you. Uh, staff will unmute you, and uh, and you'll be able to ask your question or uh, make your comment. Uh, we're trying to get uh, a poll going here just before we get started. Uh, and, and so just to get a sense, we've got uh, more than 100 folks on the line. Um, this is uh, Councillor Fletcher and myself, our, our town hall here tonight. So uh, if you want to, you see the poll that's popped up on your screen. We'll get a sense of where everyone's calling in from. Are you Beaches East York resident, uh, Coxwell to Vic Park? Are you Toronto Danforth? Uh, I believe Broadview to Coxwell. Uh, other part of Toronto or, uh, or outside of the city? Because I know these, these discussions are super interesting and we draw a pretty big crowd. Uh, so we'll leave that open for uh, <laughs> we we'll leave that open for another second or two. Get your answers in, and we'll see. Is it uh, is it Beaches East York residents out tonight, or is it Toronto Danforth? Paul, we should have had a, a wager. Oh man, smoke me. Toronto Danforth, forty five fifty eight percent there. All right, Ward fourteen takes it tonight uh, this year for for the twenty twenty one consultation, uh, and that's cool that we got folks from from across the city jumping in as well. So uh, that was fun. Uh, so I think we're going to jump into a couple of questions. As I said, uh, we had questions submitted in advance. Uh, lots of them were were sort of duplicates thematically. So I think off the top. Uh, for, for myself and Paula and Gary, um, the ones I kind of want to uh, jump into off the top, uh, we'll talk about COVID, uh, we'll talk about policing, and we will talk about uh, small business, and then we'll, we'll go and take questions from the floor. So uh, first question uh, reads, given this is a budget put together during and in light of COVID, uh, how has this pandemic changed your priorities for the city and the budget? And uh, I think we just had a very detailed conversation and presentation from Steve Conforti on that. Uh, but uh, just very briefly, I, I will say, as we heard from uh, Councillor Crawford's opening re remarks, uh, in many ways, COVID has kind of changed everything from a budget process uh, and, and the magnitude of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's forced us to focus, uh, you know, in a sense that the, the changes haven't necessarily uh, been dramatic, uh, but it's brain brought into sharper focus and relief uh, what matters the most. And I think that this budget tries to focus on that. And certainly, Sad Rafi's work through the Toronto Office of Rebuild and Recovery, that report that came to council, it really talked about, uh, you know, us taking an equity perspective uh, as we look at um, the pathway forward and how we consider, you know, our divisional responses and transformations across, across this organization. It challenges us to, to look ahead in, in light of what we've experienced in the, in the pandemic, where the existing challenges have really just been exacerbated. Uh, for me, those priorities, uh, certainly su supporting our local business sector, making sure that Main Street uh, not only recovers, but thrives in the new world post-pandemic. Um, we, we know that Main Streets have really struggled in a world that continues to be dominated by by the Amazons and on time online retail. Uh, I think that we've seen uh, new opportunities for road safety. Uh, again, I was speaking about the hyper-local trips in, in our community, uh, how mobility is changing, uh, both from a transit perspective, but also from an active transportation perspective. Uh, I think we've seen in the East End a, a initiatives at, like Destination Danforth, which have really changed the look and feel of our neighborhood. Um, you know, they, they've been a lifeline for small businesses. They've also made it a lot safer for those local trips in the community. Um, transit, uh, something that, you know, didn't get uh, a whole lot of attention for the TTC hitting a ma major milestone last year, uh, but we have now acquired what is the greenest fleet of buses anywhere in transit system in North America. We have more electric buses on the roads now than, than any other jurisdiction. Uh, and also critical uh, on transit through, uh, through the COVID system was an initiative we working on speeding up bus priority lanes. Uh, so if you've been out in the East End, uh, the deep east out towards Councillor Crawford, Morningside, you'll see that red paint on the road there, bus priority for surface transit. Uh, so again, making those trips safer and more frequent for people who are riding the bus right now. Uh, and then I think the last thing is, is certainly new affordable housing. Uh, 
Councilor Fletcher talked a lot about this. She's been a huge champion for that. Um, and the pressure that COVID has put on our housing system um, and then how that's reflected in the budget. Um, you know, we see over a billion dollars of investment in housing of all kinds in this budget. And I think that's key, especially alongside other uh, priorities. And, and some of that is a result of new funding coming from the province and the, the feds. Um, and, you know, so modular homes, which you're going to see more of uh, our ability to move folks out of the shelter system into supportive housing. That is the key. Uh, as everyone knows, you know, you, you could build shelters to infinity and that wouldn't address the problem. We need to focus on building housing for folks and modular is a rapid way that we can de deploy those systems and get people housed properly and help them transition out of the shelter system. So this, this budget accounts for that. So those are a couple of hot takes uh, on, on COVID response and priority that we see in the budget. And maybe I'll turn it over to you, Councillor Fletcher. And we'll just pull off yeah. mute there. Yeah. Thank you. I inadvertently muted myself there earlier on. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. And we'll get shortly to your questions. But we did, when we asked for questions ahead of time, big ones came up like COVID, uh, like policing, like climate, and a few other things. So just to quickly go off what Brad said, COVID has been... Uh, actually offered some opportunities and it because of uh because of covid we have prioritized different modes of transportation and i know that many of you on this call tonight were as excited as we were about getting that beautiful cycle track on the danforth everybody's very jealous of that i just have to tell all you eastenders that that they say, how did you get that? Look at that. It looks great because of Cafe TO, which is another response to COVID, which we are planning to maintain. I think there's certain transformations to draw people back out on the street and animate our main streets. We know how important our main streets are. The Danforth, the Queen Street, Girard, Pape, Broadview, Coxwell. They're so critical. And um, the city turned on a dime. So we saw that we can turn on a dime if we need to. We turned on a dime to approve things that we would never have approved any other time. That includes the cafe TO, different types of patios, modular housing. We actually did ask for an MZO, that ministerial zoning order that our premier likes to use so um, offhandedly for so many things. We did ask for that for two modular housing sites, one in Deputy Mayor Bylaw's ward and one in our budget chief's ward. Both of them have opened. And I understand in your ward, Gary, that people were bringing housewarming presents to the folks that had moved in. I do believe that COVID has showed people how difficult it is for those who are living on the streets and homeless not to have a place, not to have a support community and uh, the very Im much importance of everybody having a place to live. I will tell you that some of the spending this year, there are a lot of housing initiatives right on our shared street. That's Brad and Paula's Coxwell Avenue with John Somerville at Queen and Coxwell. And then across the street, a big housing now project at Queen and Coxwell on the east side, one at the Danforth Garage again, Brad across the street from me at Danforth and Coxwell and uh, where the new police station will move up into that site and then free up that 101 Coxwell for something good and we'll want to work with you. One of the changes with, with um, COVID has been, as we're here tonight on digital, has been the digital and the city looking at ways to do things digitally, such as Committee of Adjustment is now online. I don't know if it will ever go back to in-person because it's much simpler for everyone to be there and not sit for five hours in a room waiting for your five minutes in front of the Committee of Adjustment. We have a focus on tenant needs, such as anti-evictions. City Council has been so clear, don't evict tenants. We've also told Toronto Community Housing, don't evict tenants for simple um, rent arrears. Many people are having rent arrears right now, and they should not be out on the street 
there's nowhere for them to go. So there have been a number of things that I'll say, uh, you know, where we've had a lemon, we've made lemonade, but there are so many things where it has just been more difficult and I don't know what normal will actually be when we get back. I think that one of the things that many people said about the pandemic was we need to build back, not better, not only better, but we need to build back green. As we've seen this opportunity for uh, different types of modular uh, housing, of modal transportation, we also need to grab green and make sure that as we're making change, we're making green change in the city of Toronto. So those are some of the things I think that, that COVID has brought to the forefront that we wouldn't be talking about in the way we are without that. Thank you. Well said, Paula. And uh, I'll flip it over to Gary. Uh, any other thoughts on, on the COVID, well, what will be known as the COVID budget? Well, I think you two have given a good uh, sense of where the priorities are across the street. Um, I mean, simply with me, um, as, especially as budget chair, is equity. Um, one of our biggest priorities in the city is equity, uh, and I think we do a good job. But I think this budget has really shown to me um, how it is important to, to look at those who are struggling, those who do not have the same kind of uh, support systems, and, and all of that, that, again, we as a city, I, I, and I think a lot of people here find incredibly important and and we do a lot of work but i think we need to do a lot more um and and this has shown very much so with the, you know the the diversity of the city and, and how um certain areas of the city are, are are better off than others and certain other areas struggle um we look at the challenges we've had um you know with the police and anti-black racism and some of the challenges we're looking at there this really and and, and most things are driven by dollars and and, and how money is spent and I, I think that for for me really has opened up my eyes not opened up my eyes but in, enhanced the the importance of equity um and the second biggest point is looking at as we move forward, we've had to rely on the two uh, provincial and federal governments to, to help support uh, in a lot of our revenue losses with the TTC, of course. But I think what it, it has done through COVID is, and when you're looking at the opportunities, I think there's an opportunity for us now to, to look at a different kind of um, partnership or discussion with the other levels of government and the role of municipalities and how they're funded. So I think that as, as we're moving forward, we have seen um, a lot of success and, and Steve, I know has been involved along with the city manager and the mayor in some great uh, table conversations uh, at the other levels of government. I think moving out of this, we will have probably uh, need a reliance on the other two levels of government for a little while, um, whether it's one or two years. But I think as we move forward, it's looking at um, things like TTC and looking at um, the shelter system and public health. Um, and those areas that really are probably more directed towards provincial and federal responsibilities and ensuring that that partnership is much, is strong. Uh, we'll work, uh, as, as Paula would know, with Toronto Community Housing, the investments that the, the federal government have, have putting into affordable housing, which is really great. But I think now with COVID and moving forward, um, there's more importance on those kind of relationships with the other two levels of government. It's true. Very good. Okay, thank you, Gary. I'm going to jump to our next sort of thematic question. Um, and, and that one has to do with policing. Uh, certainly something that's been uh, top of mind for everybody, uh, regardless of, of how you feel about it. It's been a really important conversation that we've been having here in Toronto and, and you know, uh, jurisdictions really across North America and around the world. Uh, the question is, in June 2020, uh, Council voted to reform and detest Toronto Police Service. How does this budget advance that important work in 2021? Uh, who wants to start with that, uh, with that one? Uh, Paula, Gary, myself. I'll just to... I'll just jump in really quickly Go and for it. say that um, at council now we're going to be discussing a community crisis support service pilot that definitely came out of the big discussions that we had in June, <clears throat> and I know many people on this call probably emailed us, um, and we are to defund the police, you know what the vote was. But one of the things that was top of mind was how to deal with people that are in mental health crises and not just sending in 
an, the, the police. So there is a pilot that's coming tomorrow. I think no matter what we're doing, I would like to go faster. I would like to go deeper. And um, the this pilot that many people have asked for will be looking at that. And I think trying to speed that up number of years doesn't work. What we've learned, I just want to say this, and I, I know my colleagues from the budget committee are on the budget committee, but we've learned that if we need to go fast, we can go fast. And this is an area where people, our communities, our city want us to go faster. So that would be my commitment to speed this up, to continue looking for those of you who are strong advocates to defund, what we did get from all of your advocacy was the Auditor General will now be able and has been invited in. The Auditor General can go in any department anywhere in the City of Toronto, but could not just go into the police and say, I'm going to go in and look at how they spend their money. Due to the advocacy in the spring and summer, the Auditor General has now been allowed to go in to start looking at the police budget. There is no oversight on that budget except for this budget committee. There is no Auditor General who can go in and say, I think you're spending too much on this. You're spending too much on that. Why don't you think about doing it differently? And that to me is a good news story. We will know where the money is to remove when the Auditor General finishes her work. Yeah, uh, great, great comments, uh, Paula, and, and I would I would agree with that. You know, um, back in at the the council decision, um, you know, I, I supported motions that would both defund and uh, and reform because I think that we needed to send a clear message that we're we're very serious about achieving the reforms uh, and you know what we refer to as just tasking uh, some of the, the, the services uh, in Toronto police. And, and again, we ask a ton, we ask a tremendous amount of, uh, of folks in uniform with Toronto police services and, and recognizing that there, there's probably other folks out there that could provide uh, better responses to some of the calls that come in through 911. Some of the discussion and budget committee questions that were asked, I believe the number was 36,000 calls uh, last year uh, to 911 uh, were related to, to mental health uh, crisis response. And so I think that, you know, one, there, were, there was a, a number of recommendations that came out um, in the fall. Uh, council and staff have been working very, very hard on that. Uh, and this budget that we have in front of us does set out key actions to, to drive that reform that is definitely needed. And, you know, I know that there's, there's calls for defunding of 50% and, and the, um, you know, uh, community has been very loud and vocal. And I think that's important. And as Paula said, you know, your, your vocal calls for action are helping to drive reform and change. And that's important. Uh, you know, change never happens as, as fast as any of us want. We understand that. Uh, and it's important to all also take the time to get it right, frankly, um, restructuring the entire model of policing and crisis response in the city. Uh, it is going to take time. Uh, we were at budget committee asking those, those questions of staff, are we going as fast as possible? And I think I, I suspect you'll probably see motions uh, through budget to try and speed that up wherever absolutely possible. It's hard to look at the report and, and you know, cast ahead to 2026 before we would have this sort of rolled out in its entirety across the city. Uh, we need to find ways to go faster. But you also need to figure out, you know, we are creating an entire new, entirely new model for this city and largely a new model uh, for any city of this size as big as and complex as Toronto, anywhere else in North America. The, the good thing is we are listening to community. We're going to be working with community organizations to build this pilot. They're actually going to tell us the resources, the model, how they want to do it. And that's part of the process and the work that needs to take place uh, now and in the months ahead. It's going to be really important. Um, you know, over the past five years, Toronto police have seen an increase of 32% in, uh, you know, those calls, which they classify as uh, persons in, dis in distress. And so that's, that's a huge pressure uh, for them. And again, I think everybody, there's an honest acknowledgement that uh, Toronto police is not necessarily set up to handle that, those type of calls um, in, and get the best outcomes. So uh, it's exciting that we are embarking on this, but it is a long journey. Um, 
that report that came to exec last week, uh, which was called non-police-led response for non-emergency, non-violent calls. A uh, bit of a mouthful, very bureaucratic. Uh, but that that lays out the roadmap for this pilot. Um, and, you know, I I think here in our, our ward here in the East End, uh, we have seen the local action on this front. Councillor Fletcher off the top was talking about, you know, uh, how we coordinated a community response to the racist incidents at Michael Garrett Hospital, um, supporting new youth programs, attending lear- learning circles, listening um, to, to residents and having those conversations. It's hugely important to inform, inform the work that we're doing and, and we're all learning uh, and we need to come up with a new model. So um, despite the financial challenges uh, of the pandemic, we are making the financial commitments uh, to move that work forward um, because it's going to be an essential part of an equitable recovery. And uh, the line items are, are in the budget, um, but you know, just as important are the conversations and the investment that we have in the local work to get that done. And I'm looking forward to being a part of that change. Uh, and I invite everyone on the line to reach out so that we can continue to have those conversations. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more, uh, I think when you, if you Google the CAHOOTS uh, model out of Eugene, Oregon, that's certainly, I've had a lot of meetings uh, with, with different experts that, uh, that know a lot more about this sort of stuff than I do, to be honest. And um, CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon is sort of a 21st century approach uh, to community safety and, uh, and how, we might build something like that at a much bigger scale here in, in Toronto. So um, some of my thoughts on that, maybe Gary, if you want to weigh in. Yeah, just quickly, um, you know, I've always supported uh, reforming the police. I think that's, uh, you know, being our largest budget item. Uh, and over the seven years, I've seen it uh, increase, um, you know, quite a bit. Uh, mind you, there've been three years where they, they did zero uh, percent, but regardless, I very much am supportive of, of reforms that have to happen. And I think the task force that have come out of uh, some of the work over the last year we're working on, I think is about 34, 35 are reforms. Uh, one of the more important ones, uh, community crisis response is coming to council tomorrow as, as Brad and uh, Paul had mentioned, fully supportive of that. And when I really saw the initiative on, on what that could potentially do, um, and it really means, do you really need a police officer going out to all these emergency calls? Um, you don't. Um, you, you can have, um, you know, medical uh, professionals and people going out um, who, you know, can support the, the individ- individuals or, or community members in need. And I think that's a critically important aspect of the kind of reform that I think needs to happen across the city. And, and frankly, probably wouldn't have happened um, without the calls from the public to look at the reforms. Um, I'm, as my, my, uh, um, my vote has shown at council, I, I don't know whether or not the whole defunding the police, whether 50% or 10% is actually the answer. Uh, I think we can find the alternatives. It's not about taking money away from some place and add it, adding it to another. I think we need to look at ways to add the, the appropriate amount of funding to be able to look at the services and supports that we need across the city. Um, and so that's kind of where I look at this, um, recognizing it's a very divisive issue, and I think we need to listen to everybody, uh, but moving forward on reforms. And yes, we'll have the debate about how quickly um, and how slower, but I think the fact that we are moving forward, and I think the city council, by I think all of us recognize that we have to, and as to do the police, when I've had conversations with the police through the budget process, they recognize the, need to, the reforms need to happen. Um, and when you're looking at just civ- civ- civilianization um, and, and um, officers, um, it, it, the, uh, the balance has changed over the last number of years, more civilian people working. So I think we're, we're going forward. The issue, of course, is how quick and how slow. And I think that's part of the, the debate we're having right now. Um, and, and the police have, I mean, it, it granted, um, it may not be what people would expect or want, but in this budget, they did bring a 0%, which means they actually went out and found savings, efficiencies and changes worth about $46 million. Again, recognizing people will probably want a lot more than that, but I think work is being done and there's a recognition that work has to be done at all diff- different levels in, in the police. And that's, I see that more on, on what I'm, and, and that Steve does too. I think Steve's uh, been working quite closely with the police over the last number of years. So we see um, the willingness and the drive to want to make change, but again, it's how quick and what that change looks like is part of the debate. Good. Okay. Very good. Thanks for that, Gary. So I think uh, looking at the time, I want to want to make sure we can ask uh, answer the questions of the folks uh, on the floor here. We're going to do one more poll uh, and and 
Paula, if you want to take us through this, we'll throw it up on the screen, see what the question is. And then we're going to start uh, going through the list of uh, folks on the line who want to ask questions. If we can get that poll up. Paula, you want to take us there, through it? Yep, that is the poll. If, have you attended or watched other online city budget meetings this year? Have you attended city budget meetings in previous years? Have you reviewed budget information on the city website? Or this is my first engagement with the budget process. So obviously you can answer more than one, except for the last one. If you do that one, you don't get to go on any of the other ones. Please. That's good. To, to your point earlier, go Paula, we're... Yeah, to your point earlier, we're seeing a lot of folks uh, finding new ways to engage and online certainly makes it, uh, you know, in some ways uh, more accessible to, to more people. Totally. So get the results totally. up there. Yep. That's great. Look at that. Uh, we have a number of people that were in looking at the budget already. They've gone on the website. That's great. 35%, 26 people, this is the first time. We'd love to hear how you feel about it. And 42% uh, have been engaged before. So welcome back. You're very important and you, uh, your input's always important. Thank you so much. Fantastic, that's great. Thanks for coming out, folks. Uh, so we're gonna jump to the floor now. Uh, so again, we will, uh, I'll call your name. I'm writing a list uh, down here and we'll pull you off mute. You can ask your question or give your comment. And uh, we will start with uh, Brendan Hendel McCarthy followed by Jeff Levitt. Jeff, good to see you. Uh, and then uh, Rima Burns McGowan, our MPP for Peaches East York. Oh. Those will be our first three. Sure. So Brendan, you, uh, we've got you off mute call. and you're good to go. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Bradford and Councillor Fletcher for organizing this meeting and Councillor Crawford for being on as well. Um, I just wanted to echo that point. Um, we, we've been here, we're going to hear a lot about what we can spend the city's budget on tonight. Um, and I think what we need to focus on is the single largest budget item, and that's the Toronto Police Service, right? You guys, are, you guys as councillors know that $1.08 billion dollars is more than the combined total budget for community housing, shelters, support, housing services, transportation, employment services, and the library combined. Um, it's ridiculous that we're paying over a billion dollars a year for a militarized organization to terrorize neighborhoods. Um, we need it to stop. And there's just so many better things that money can be spent on. Um, it's heartbreaking to continually see generations of marginalized populations murdered by police um, and it's why organizations like Black Lives Matter are calling for a 50% reduction on the Toronto Police Service budget. So I mean I know that the, the province is in charge of that police budget. I'm glad to hear uh, that the Auditor General will, will be reviewing the police budget. That was great news. Thank you Paula Fletcher. Um, I'm echoing all the voices you've, you're going to hear tonight and that you've heard over the last several weeks, uh, months I'm sure. Uh, there will protests over the summer, right? This has been a long uh, battle. Uh, we need to defund by 50% um, and reallocate those funds towards other community services that those marginalized populations can benefit from and improve their lives. Very good. Well, thanks, Brandon. Uh, and appreciate I, I don't that. Have a question. That was my comment. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate that uh, comment. Well received. And, and again, I think that uh, we have certainly heard that. Uh, from a lot of folks in, in deputations. I know uh, Councillor Crawford and I on budget, we, we definitely heard a lot of that this year. And, and again, um, as Councillor Fletcher was saying, uh, the advocacy work in, in communities has been really important to help shift the needle on this and move forward. And again, I think we all appreciate uh, getting towards that. You know, we want outcomes, right? You know, we want to see better outcomes in our communities and uh, getting there is, is going to take time. Um, but the, you know, the point is well taken and, uh, Paul, I don't know if you want to respond to that at all. I think we're going to probably hear a lot of that tonight. Yeah. I'm just going to say, keep pushing. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, when the auditor comes back, I want you and everybody to be there for that meeting. So you can look at what the auditor has found. This is not a one-time show. This is now a commitment to keep pushing, keep moving to make change. City Council is not going to make change on its own. This CAHOOTS program that was mentioned, that Gary mentioned, Brad mentioned, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Brendan, uh, shifting the emergency response for mental health and distress calls of that nature from a military response 
to a medical model, I think is number one. That in essence is starting to move in that direction. It is not easy to do. Please keep supporting us. Please keep pushing. We're listening and trying. Very good. Uh, we're going to jump to Jeff, Jeffrey Levitt, uh, followed by Rima Burns McGowan, and, uh, and then Sadie Epstein Fine. Um, thanks, uh, Councillor Bradford. Uh, I'd also like to start by uh, thanking the councillors and the staff for bringing the budget to us and with the, the comprehensive explanation. It's really hard for us as residents to comment on a budget if we don't know what the budget is about. So thanks very much for helping us to understand it to be able to put our, our comments and our thoughts in, in context. Uh, my one comment uh, very briefly is on the climate action front. And um, I understand from the Toronto Environmental Alliance that the city's um, Environment and Energy Division is slated to take uh, a hit in its budget. And um, one of the, the consequences of that is that the city's net zero plan may be further delayed. And um, so I would hope that the Environment and Energy Division could be adequately resourced. The fear would be if the net zero plan at the top gets delayed, that could result in ripple effects of delaying other, uh, or other climate uh, initiatives in the city. So that's, uh, that's my comment. Yeah, good, good comment, Jeff. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond quickly and, and probably we'll hear more about this as well. Um, I think that uh, it's important to note there's there's probably been a bit of misunderstanding uh, around the transform TO budget and, and maybe Steve Comforti wants to jump in on this. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, as a result of the pandemic, as a result of staff being redeployed, uh, you know, for example, out to shelters and different services, um, not everything, you know, and the same could be said for all of our divisions advanced on a business as usual schedule because it was anything but that. Uh, and, and you're right to point out that the development of the net zero strategy, uh, which was meant to be rolled out by now, uh, there are revised timelines for that, uh, for sure. And, you know, uh, it would be naive to suggest that there's not implications of that. Uh, we've also seen that the city has been able to recalibrate and get back on course uh, and make adjustments on, on these programs, especially when we're talking about Transform TO and we're working in, you know, decades and looking ahead. Uh, but to be clear, and, and Steve can maybe jump in on this or, or Gary, uh, the city has not reduced what we're investing in Transform TO. Um, my understanding is the overall budget envelope in 2021 uh, is lower because the city isn't getting some of the federal funding um, that we've previously had. But the city's contribution is not going down. Um, the staff in the department is, is being maintained. And we're actually up, uh, I think, 20 20 FTEs or staff members on 2019 numbers. So, you know, that was 10 million uh, in 2019, 13 million in 2020, uh, because we had dollars from the federal government uh, and $10.2 million in 2021. So that's, that's what we're looking at. And, you know, the same thing, we'll talk about childcare. I'm sure we'll have questions about that. We've had injections of funding from other levels of government, right, one-time funding, uh, which obviously raises our, our budget for that item, um, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean that the city's contribution is less going forward. It's just we don't necessarily have those funding commitments from other partners, and uh, it's a good question because it's it's top of mind, uh, you know, for a lot of people. And you know what we hear from staff is is that uh, we're investing at the rate. Uh, that staff are able to deliver the programs. Now, we could have a conversation about should we have more staff so that we can deliver programs more quickly. That's a fair discussion and debate to have. Uh, but, you know, you talk to Jim Baxter at Energy and Environment, and, and that is the answer that he provides to us at budget. So just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Uh, and I think we've got some folks probably from T on the line who will want to talk about that also. But it is very important. We're doing a lot of different things. Um, and uh, to be able to maintain it in this year, I think is something that was really important for all of us. Uh, Steve, did you wanna just jump in to clarify the transform TO thing? Cause there's been a lot of discussion about that. Yeah, no, and I, and I think you, you touched on it well. Um, you know, there were obviously some COVID impacts in 2020. There were staff that were redeployed to ensure we had critical services in place. And as a result of that, some initiatives uh, were delayed in their ability to advance but the plan still exists to be able to move on that. The staff are, are still budgeted for 
Um, and in fact, if you look at the budgeted uh, dollars in 2021 compared to what the actual expenditures were in 2020, we are expecting uh, uh, the budget to increase. And, and, and not to, to understate, but on the capital side as well, we're adding nearly $200 million in, uh, in initiatives that uh, directly address climate change as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paula, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, uh, maybe we just need to show it as a better package because I just said earlier, uh, we need to not only build back better, we need to build back greener. And many countries in dealing with the pandemic are being really um, aggressive and uh, sharp about adding climate issues and climate initiatives into their build back. I... Um, you know, when we were doing the cycle track, when we did Destination Danforth, Brad and I met every Friday, we met with staff. That was the importance that we had there. And I just think that uh, we should keep pushing. It's a big issue and we need to be meeting regularly on these. And I'll put a plug in tomorrow for to you, Brad. I'm gonna, I have a motion coming for the pocket to support their neighborhood retrofit and then add in the TTC subway yards, 31 acres, add in TCH, add in parks. So I'm hoping I can get that through because we're going to have a brilliant example of taking a neighborhood and city institutions and lowering that big footprint that they have. Okay. So. Look at this. Paula never misses an opportunity whipping the votes here online. <laughs> Amazing. Very oh, good. Oh, Gary, that goes for you, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you, uh, Paula. Don't worry. Thank yeah. you. Very, very good. Getting it done. Um, so thanks, Jeff. I uh, hope that answers uh, answers the question. I'm sure it, it'll come up again tonight as well. Uh, we're going to jump to our uh, fantastic MPP, uh, Reva Burns-McGown, B2C York, who's on the line with us tonight and uh, has a question for us. We're just going to pull you off mute. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for, for having me and for, for letting me speak. And I really um, I want to thank you for the, for the very clear presentation this evening. And also um, to thank both uh, Paula and Brad for um, urging community to, to push uh, council along. So I'm going to be, it's in the spirit of that pushing that I'm going to be speaking. Um, as the critic for uh, poverty and homelessness, I can tell you that um, the things that I see and as the MPP um, have shown me the ways in which not just COVID, but the ways in which anti-Black racism and uh, racism generally impact BIPOC, BIPOC communities, anti-indigeneity. There's a reason that um, we have this crushing illustration of COVID has, has shown us the chasms that exist between BIPOC communities and everybody else. And you know this, but I think we're seeing it really in such sharp illustration right now. And so I think as we go ahead to, to make these budgets and we go ahead um, making policy moving forward, it's really time to make hard funding decisions to reallocate funding to BIPOC communities and to look at absolutely everything through an equity lens. We are at a turning point here. Um, COVID has been crushing. It's going to take years before we see just how deeply it's affected and impacted these communities. And I think it's important to understand that when communities talk about things like defunding police or even abolition, what they're talking about is a complete reimagining of how we think about community safety. And they're asking us not to think in incrementalist terms, but in, in big, bold ways of thinking, how are we going to have institutions that keep all of us safe because we all deserve to be safe? And how are we going to really reimagine what that looks like? I think we can't have sacred cows. We have to really think um, deeply and boldly and profoundly. Um, to not invest in BIPOC communities now will involve greater costs for the city down the road. And I think we're starting to see that poverty is expensive and poverty is not race neutral. There is a reason 
that we see that most people experiencing homelessness are Black and Indigenous. It's not an accident. And policing is a part of why that occurs. Um, so I think it's really important that we, we bear these things in mind at a, at a very fundamental level as we move forward. And then of course, um, some of the things to echo some of the, the points that Paula was making, rent is absolutely crucial. Um, rent relief is crucial. We can't have more people becoming homeless um, in the middle of this pandemic. And as you know, um, eviction, the sheriffs are not coming to the door now, but um, evictions are actually uh, continuing to proceed. And, um, and this, is, this isn't good for anybody, nobody benefits. Childcare is obviously huge. We can't have a recovery if we don't have a she covery. Um, it's so clear, transit is big. We can't have people being crowded on transit if we're going to get out of this because it just increases community spread. Obviously, small business recovery is huge. Climate is key. Other, level, other levels of government, uh, the province as well as the feds are going to have to, to step up here. But I guess I'm just imploring you um, as you move forward to really be bold. I think that audit of the police budget is important, but we need to go beyond incre incrementalism and we really need to think boldly here. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, well said, uh, Rima. Uh, appreciate all the comments uh, that you made there on a number of really important files. Uh, I know that you've been pushing for this stuff at Queen's Park. We've been able to work together on a number of these files. So uh, thank you for, for your work and uh, and that feedback. And I don't know, Paula, if, if, if you wanted to respond yeah. there. Uh, Rima I, I had a lot there say, for us. Yeah, that, I, I just want to say, I think that we are being bold. Shifting the model that we heard so much about from police going to every call, police going to mental health calls, uh, 10 police officers or 20 at Regis, uh, Regis's home. Uh, imagine the, just the chaos of that compared to people going that have a mental health training that understand how to de-escalate. That's been our goal for so long, all of our goals, community goal, counselor goal and reimagining community safety we are starting that and we're starting that because there was a huge movement last summer so i want to say yes there's so much more to do we can reimagine community safety but let's focus on getting this other part right we're going to need your help or it's going to happen in 2028 we don't want it in 2028 we want it fast. We want to move as fast on these things as we did on getting a zoning so we could have a, 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 a patio at Gerard Square in that little parking lot. That was, we had to change the world for that, but we can change the world. We've shown we can do it. So that's my, that's my plea to everybody on this call. Let's work together on this one thing to make it happen right and make it happen fast. And Very good. we are, yeah. Thank you. Um, fantastic. So we're going to jump to uh, next few speakers, uh, uh, Sadie Epstein-Fine. Uh, we will jump to Aleem Tharani uh, from ATU 113 and then Grand Lamb. And then I think former Councillor Janet Davis. Stay tuned. Uh, over to you, Sadie. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Rima, for just speaking. That was like, I so agree with you that right now the calls are not about incremental change. They're about reimagining what safety looks like in our city. Um, and, and you keep talking about like the pilot programs that you, that, that are starting um, to respond to um, people who are in distress, but like that's part of what is being asked of you. The other part is not complicated. It is defund the police by 50%. And I haven't heard you actually address how that defunding is going to happen, right? I've, I have heard you address kind of everything around it, but what are you going to do for the 2021 budget to address your residents 
who are asking you to defund the police by 50 percent like this is like this isn't a theory like this can be done and i would like to know how you are going to address that otherwise we are all going to feel like you have ignored like you've ignored us in our deputations today like in every single meeting that <laughs> happens in all of the town halls, this is the number one issue people are asking. So please answer directly. How are you going to do this in the 2021 budget? Who wants to do that? Well, go ahead, Paula, sorry. Well, so far, uh, that is not part of the 2021 budget. and that I've seen, although I'm not on the budget committee, but the, um, I hear you. I heard you last year. I heard uh, when years ago, when we tried to take 25 million, or not all of council agreed. So this is an issue of what, what will we take? Where would it come from? And what would be left? And I know Everybody feels very strongly about that. And I think that it's not going to go as fast as you want, but don't quit that reimagining community safety. I starts with reimagining people that phone 911 and have an officer come for a mental health crisis. Sometimes people don't want to phone. That's the reimagining. That's the funding change that will take place. Moving 911 from being simply a police operated uh, emergency service to being one that is multifaceted. I understand how quickly you want to go. Peeling this apart is um, like taking apart a bomb. You can't just pull out the, the pieces. But I want to work with you and I want to work with everybody that wants to make change. So don't let the fact that we're not probably going to defund by 50% in this budget stop you from keeping the pressure on and keeping the pushing going. Because that is the most important thing that you can do to make change. Yeah, it well said, Paula. And, and I, I would just add from my perspective, you know, Gary noted that uh, 0% increase and, and for folks that are calling for defunding, you know, they say, well, 0% increase, that's, that's not, that's not adequate. We want decrease, uh, we want defund. Uh, but to do to land at 0%, you know, with the, the cost of living and much of which, you know, frankly, um, there are increases associated with, um, you know, the collective bargaining agreements that, uh, you know, um, staff, uh, police officers have. So there's a, there's a huge budget pressure each year and hence it goes up. And so $47 million of, um, you know, savings or efficiencies that they found at a 0%, like, you know, that in itself is, is work. I think as Paulo was saying earlier, um, for the first time, we're going to have the uh, line by line budget and, and audited and review. And you have to actually know what you're dealing with and you have to be able to see what's under the hood in order for you to actually figure out how to deliver that, uh, you know, if there is defunding, if there is detasking, how those things go together. And so, you know, I think everybody hears the sentiment and, you know, you can see, say it in your comments, I can hear the passion uh, and energy and frankly, frustration, anger, like everybody can hear that and appreciate it, but there are steps that actually need to be taken. It's not as simple as just saying, well, you know, blow it up, like, okay, how do you do that? Uh, and in fact, like this pilot program that we're building that probably, you know, you and I would agree is actually really important. And again, when we focus on outcomes, the outcomes of having a much better response to the 36,000 calls of folk, folks in distress and mental health crisis calls, you know, that's actually a funding, that's a line item. You know, that's $1.8 million just to build that program. So we do actually need to be, you know, strategic about this. We have to get our hands around it uh, as, as uh, the first uh, uh, deputy said off the top of the call, we're looking at something over a billion dollars, but for the first time ever, we're actually going to get a real sense of what's under the hood, 
line by line what those items are. And then as a community, as a council, as a city, have those discussions about where it makes sense to, uh, to pull back and in some cases where it actually makes sense to invest more. That 911 investment, that might actually be out of Toronto Police. Uh, we, you know, maybe we need to build something that doesn't exist today uh, to provide better responses. But you know, we want it to go faster, but you do have to, the staff have to take the time to figure out what that looks like. And uh, certainly there's a lot of frustration and anger about that, but like, you know, that it has to actually be thought through. Um, so we hear you uh, and appreciate the comments. And Gary, did you want to jump in on that at all? Brad, I just want to say well, that when the line by line is there, then absolutely everybody can go through that line by line. And yeah. then you will know where every dollar is and you're going to guide us on where you think they should be moved from. That's a good point. Gary, you want to jump in? I mean, listen, I, I, I respect where everybody's coming from, and, and I understand the sentiments. I understand the concerns for change. So I get all of that um, 100%. It's not that. Uh, I mean, what is not also, we do not have the ability as a city council to defund by 50%. I'm going to be very clear with everybody. We cannot do that. There are legislative and legal requirements within the, the, the police act, the, the legislative, um, I don't know, the other act, like a number of acts, we don't have that ability. As much as it, you, some people on here seem to think it's just simple, just, you know, chop 50% off, we don't have that ability. Uh, I wish, you know, we could, I could say anything else. It does have to be done slowly. It does have to be done incrementally. We have legal, we, we, we are supposed to have legislated and we have no ability to change that other than through the province. Um, you know, the requirement for police officers for, uh, for, uh, um, in, in the city. Um, and we have collective agreements and, and we just can't erase collective agreements. Any of you who are in a union online would understand that. So our ability, and I understand the sentiment, our ability to do that is very challenged. And, it's, and, and the question was, can we do that in the 2021 budget? We cannot do that. And, and I just want to be clear with that. But we do need to look at and everything that Brad and, and Paula have talked about, the change and moving quickly. I get all of that. And some, it will have to be incremental and it will be happening. But I just needed to be clear um, because it, it's, it's almost, and Steve, I don't know if, if you can clarify, but uh, you know, it is almost out of our ability legislative to even do that. If we ended up doing that, I don't even know the recourse from the province of what would happen. So and I don't know if you have you know, that process if that did happen. Yeah, I can add, and you've, and you've referenced the Police Services Act, and there's a provision in there uh, which states that a municipality has to fund uh, for adequate and effective policing. And, um, and if it's deemed that there that it's not properly funded, there is an ability for that to be challenged um, provincially, and that's that's one of the restrictions that you have as it relates to police funding. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we have... Uh, Aleem next, uh, followed by Graham Lamb, Janet Davis, and Emma. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of you for putting this on. Uh, Steve, great job as well. I didn't want to leave you out. Um, so Steve's just quickly, right. a couple things um, around public transit. So I'm going to try to not take too much time, but touch on a couple things. Uh, public transit is a necessity for all, especially the marginalized and racialized communities. Uh, so that works in with that. At the same time, uh, Brad, I know you sit on TT Commissioner's Board, but if you could look at maybe how many fair enforcement tickets have been given out during COVID, I bet that's not that high. And I bet if you pull the race data, you'll see a certain thing. So I'll just leave that with you and you can think about that. Uh, we're talking about green and the environment. Look, public transit is a way to uh, make a, a, a better green less our carbon footprint and that's done through public transit so with that I, I encourage you like we need more money in our operating budget not just in our capital budget I know we want to build more transit across the city for everybody but our existing system is hanging on by maybe a little more than a thread it is outdated and I know the TT is doing a lot of things and I know city council is doing a lot of things but we need more money in operating budget um, at the same time, just it, like I'll go back, if you look at the fair enforcement aspect of what's going on, I know they're unionized as well, but like, I'm not sure that that's what's needed right now at, at this time, and especially with, with COVID. There are other things where we can allocate TTC budget and funding, 
And I know we're looking at the level of ridership that's decreasing, but I also think we need to look at paying ridership. So the ridership levels are still higher than what is proposed, but the paying ridership has decreased significantly. And I'll just leave you with that. Thank you for your time, everybody, and stay safe. Can Thanks I just, very uh, much. Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Can I just have a comment about that? What, Aline, no what you talk, sorry, what you talked about, and I think it's relevant to people here that are concerned uh, with policing, and that is the special constables at the TTC, the special constables at TCHC, and the model of special constables, how they're being deployed, what the ticketing looks like. You referred to that, Aleem. I think you mean that, this, uh, and TTC is looking at that, Brad, the number of racialized people that are being ticketed compared to the number of white people that are being ticketed. And um, at TCHC, there's a concern about the number of special constables that have been hired. So when we talk about reimagining community safety, let's reimagine it on a macro level and not just looking at TPS, but in general, what that means for Toronto. Thanks. Just what, sorry, just one more thing. And, and, and you know what? We, we want a seat at the table as well, you know? Like when it comes to public transit, we'd love to be at that table to be part of that conversation. I won't get too much into the politics, but you know what I'm saying? My email address is available. Paula has it, Brad, I'm sure you have it. Gary, we've, we've done some events with you, just like, please, if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you for your time again. Thanks, Aline. Thanks, Aline, appreciate that. And, and I, you know, I, I pick up on your comment there about operating dollars. Uh, the TTC riders pay the highest portion of Fairbox uh, revenue of any system of its size in North America. Uh, and that is because unlike other jurisdictions, we don't see a nickel uh, for operating dollars. It's a huge line item in our budget on our property tax base. We spend nearly $900 million a year uh, for fair subsidy from the city's end and the rest is out of the Fairbox not a nickel from the province of the federal government, uh, this, the, the country's largest, most vital transit system. And uh, politicians always wanna cut ribbons. They wanna you know, be at capital projects, there's lots of capital dollars, but it's time for provincial and federal governments to step up and put some money towards operating to keep these trains running. So uh, just, I'll get off my soapbox. No, I'm back on the soapbox. Yeah. Okay. Historically, it was the Harris government that there was a 50% support for the TTC from the provincial government that was cut under the first big Tory government, the Harris government. So they might like to cut ribbons, but they also like to cut transit back then. So let's Ooh, restore that. Okay. For, Ooh, I took off yeah. on your uh, ribbon. Yeah, I like you, that. Brad. Uh, very good. Uh, okay, so thanks for the comments, and we appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna jump to Graham Lamb, followed by Janet Davis, and then Emma. Oh, I should say, folks, I'm sorry. Uh, obviously, the time has really slipped away here. Uh, we still got 90 plus folks on the line. Uh, I would propose, and, and Gary and Steve, if you got to jump off, I understand. But I propose we extend to 915 to just try and get a few more questions in. I've been uh, long winded and, and I'm sorry. Uh, so if, if folks want to stay on, uh, we'll, we'll wrap uh, and close at 915, but get a few more questions in. And um, let's go over to Graham and then Janet Davis and Emma. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm one of those people who uh, Councillor Fletcher mentioned a moment ago who don't want to call 911. Uh, at my, my workplace up until the pandemic, I had to make a lot of emergency calls, unfortunately. And uh, that meant I've heard a lot of ugly comments from police officers that made me more concerned about the safety of people who were in distress. Uh, so it got to the point where my coworkers and I uh, would you know, keep our fingers crossed whenever we called them on hoping that paramedics would be the first to arrive. And whenever it was police instead, our hearts just sank. And I don't want to feel that again when we go back to work. Uh, and unfortunately, while the, these pilot projects that have been uh, supported are, are really exciting, uh, they're not at the scale that's going to really change uh, that experience for a long time for most people who are making uh, 911 calls. Uh, so I, I understand the need to build up these, 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 new, new, uh, these new bodies, but none of us took to the streets last summer calling for enhanced oversight. None of us took to the streets last summer calling for uh, finding efficiencies and savings within the budget, uh, or even for a three-year pilot project, right? We went out into the streets calling for reducing the scope of policing. Uh, and it's disappointing that, that that's not reflected whatsoever in the budget proposals that we've seen tonight. 
Um, and I, I would like to get some clarity on, on this point. Um, Councillor Crawford said that a 50% reduction is on the table this year, whether it's feasible or not, people have disagreements on, but you know, setting that aside, uh, am I hearing uh, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bradford saying that you're not going to push for a reduction in the police budget for 2021, that you are going to wait for the Auditor General support? Because personally, I, I view that as unacceptable. I've always voted for a reduction in that budget, starting for many years ago, including now. I will see what motions are going to be there. I do want to reduce the scope of policing, you know, that you're talking about. I want it to go faster and I want you to push for those changes to go faster. Take it off 911, get the CAHOOTS model moving immediately, as fast as we were putting in patios, get the new model going. That's my commitment. That's what I want. That's what I want. And that's what I want you to push for because that's tangible. It's real. And we can make that happen faster because I also don't want you worried about phoning 911 for people in distress. Yeah, thanks for sharing your experience, Graham. Um, appreciate the feedback. Uh, similarly, I, I don't know what motions are going to be moved. Uh, I've supported the funding uh, in the past. Uh, truthfully, I think that kind of the comments that were expressed tonight about, you know, building this program uh, and from your experience, you know, the, the distress and concern about calling 911, the anxiety, the, the real concern about what sort of outcome you're going to have, like figuring that out uh, has to be a top priority. And as we said earlier, like we're actually spending, you know, $1.8 million just to put that proposal together. Um, as Paula has said, as I have said, and you know, as Gary has said, uh, I think there's concern across council about the speed in which this is moving forward. Uh, I, you know, I think there will be motions to expedite that. I don't think anyone is satisfied with something that is going to take years and years and years. Uh, so we hear the community, we hear your feedback. Um, you know, we will do what we can. There is also the, the like practical frustrating reality of we're building something from the ground up that doesn't exist. Looking at other models is where we need to start, but we also need to listen to the community here in Toronto and these organizations that are actually, you know, hopefully going to be uh, involved in, in administering, developing and implementing the program. So it's, it's heavy work and it's going to take time and, and people are going to be frustrated and angry about that, but we need you to, you know, understand that we are trying trying our best um but your frustration is warranted and, and we hear that too uh, so thanks for your comments we are going to move to uh former councillor janet davis who's on the line tonight uh janet thanks for joining us we're just pulling you off mute there the name just says janet but i can see that it's janet davis there we go mm -hmm. Well, it's great to see all of you again. I know this is a difficult process. Um, uh, Steve, I have some very specific questions about long-term care, um, but I maybe I can ask them of you another time. Is that okay? <laughs> but I see my friend uh, Kareen is here today. She's also on the board advisory committee of True Davidson Long-Term Care with me and uh, many others who are concerned about uh, the funding for long-term care. We need and expect some additional funding from the uh, provincial government to maintain the staffing and uh, the COVID pay that was cut uh, in August. There was an increase for long-term care and child care uh, extra pay to recognize the essential service there. Um, but there's, you're expecting 800 or hoping for $856 million. Um, and I guess my question to the politicians is, if that money does not come, are you prepared to vote for uh, a tax increase? Uh, there's been a call for uh, 1.5 instead of 0.7. Uh, and are you prepared to look at borrowing more money for the capital budget as opposed to using other strategies that would change uh, either redu reducing the capital program or using other strategies like capital to current um, or 
current capital uh, cuts and so on. So that's my question. Are you prepared to uh, vote for higher taxes and prepared to uh, fund, uh, borrow more for the capital budget so that we can continue to invest in the things that we desperately need in this city? Great question. I don't know if you want me to start and uh, probably we all want to weigh in on this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to look at every option. Uh, first and foremost, I think is, I, I also don't want to let the province uh, off the hook, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing to look at every option. Uh, but first and foremost, we are relying on that, that commitment. Um, previously, what we saw last year, what we've asked for this year, there's been a lot of intergovernmental work. Uh, I, you know, I know the mayor um, and our city manager are involved in those discussions. And uh, as Gary has alluded, uh, fairly confident that, that that money is going to come through. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, the age old story, right? You know, the the province uh, or, or other levels of government have historically had a funding commitment, and then it doesn't come through. And then you're faced with the question, okay, like, you know, the city's holding the bag. And there's been decades of that downloading in, in different examples. And it puts a tremendous amount of, of pressure uh, on a property tax base that historically was not designed or allocated to pay for these types of services. And yet they are so vital and will be very vital in, in light of our recovery, um, particularly the childcare piece. So very sensitive to that. I think, uh, I think we got to look at all options, but first and foremost, my preference is certainly to have the other orders of government that really do have carriage of these files, uh, you know, follow through with their commitments and responsibilities. I, I don't know, Paula, do you want to jump in, Gary? Well, let me jump. I mean, I'm, I've been fairly consistent on um, where I stand uh, with regard to raising taxes. Um, I've always, along with the mayor, tried to keep the, the city affordable. Um, and in doing so, raising taxes at the rate of inflation, that has been very consistent over the last six years um, that I have been doing. Uh, and we've made some additions to the city building fund, uh, which is one and a half percent. So we did. I did support the city building fund. I do support it coming this year. Um, but folks, when you're looking at the, the challenges that COVID has been facing, when you looked at, and, and TOR, the Toronto Office of Rebuild and Recovery, did a lot of work. Uh, Sad Rafi did an incredible amount of work when you look at the report. And overwhelmingly, what he heard back from residents all across the city is you need to keep this city affordable during this pandemic. This is not the time to be raising taxes. That was a very, um, it was very clear to me when I read the report that we, need to keep the city affordable. So again, as I've been consistent in, in keeping the city affordable, I'm also on the other side wanting to ensure that we continue to invest in the city. And, and Steve, you've been involved in this. If you go back and look year after year after year over the last six years, we have kept uh, property taxes affordable, um, more or less at the rate of inflation, um, but we have invested in the city. Um, you, what, I mean, when we're looking at historic investments in, in the TTC, when you look at where we were, um, six years ago, I think we we're around four or $500 million in investment. We're up to over $800 million. We continue to invest. So that has been my position all along. It can be, continue to be my position. It was a 0.7% uh, increase that the city manager has recommended. I'll be supporting that no more, plus the 1.5% city building fund. With regard to, um, and Janet mentioned about borrowing more money, I have to be clear, we have, a, we have a debt ceiling that we work on, and that's the amount of money we can borrow based on how much money comes in. Um, we have a top-notch um, rating by the rating agencies across the, 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 uh, the country and the province. They look at Toronto's uh, bond ratings and our ratings as really well. If we start spending more than this 15% ceiling, we do threaten that sometimes that ability for the rating agencies to really look at us. So we have to be fiscally responsible. We have to govern properly. That is my role as the budget chief. And I take that very seriously. Um, so when you're looking at raising, um, as Janet mentioned, borrowing more money, um, we will have to pay it back. Um, and we have, and Steve, I think Steve even mentioned when you're looking at the increases in our capital, but we have been borrowing more money when we're looking at um, this. And, and Steve, if you could just maybe mention that we're actually looking at um, borrowing over a billion dollars this year, if, or if we're, we're doing debt for over a billion dollars, where four or five years ago, I think it was around $600 million. So every, we actually do increase every year our ability to borrow more, but we have to do it responsibly. And I, I think, um, and I think, you know, uh, we have been doing it responsibly. So that's my quick answer to that. 
Janet, we, we pulled you back off mute because I see that you're you're yes. waving and exasperated, but I'm really cognizant of the time. So just okay. a quick maybe I, reply. I just wanted to say that Toronto's taxes, uh, tax rate uh, falls far below uh, all the other municipalities in the GTA. And historically, we've not had the courage uh, to move it up to even the provincial average. And uh, I think if there's ever a time to do it, it's right now. Thanks for joining us. Paula, did you want to, did you want to weigh in on this at all? Or if we, uh, have we covered it? Mute. No, I'm just going to say that our revenue tools, Janet, when you and I were on council and started, that was a very bold time when our mayor at that time got the city of Toronto act and brought in uh, land transfer tax, which we're living off of now. And also city of Toronto act allowed us many other revenue tools, including tolls, which, Last term, we tried uh, to do, and it was turned down by the Liberal government of that day. So we didn't get that extra money coming from that side. We do have a Toronto uh, a city building fund. I generally have voted for tax increases because I know we do have the basically the lowest taxes. And I also think Torontonians are willing to contribute to a city building fund. That's to build the subway, and we've added other things on. I think that they would be up for housing because everybody knows how important that is. So the property tax remains one way, but we have other ways that we're raising money that are creative and um, let's just keep doing it. Very good. Uh, thank you. So we're, I think we've got time for two more. If we can both be concise, we'll go Emma and then Rob Hatton <coughs> and Rob, good to see you as well. So we'll start with Emma and then we'll wrap with Rob and uh, take it away, Emma. Thank you so much for taking my comment question. Uh, I respect that everyone's staying a little bit later and I really appreciate that. Um, I really understand the importance of oversight of the police budget, I really do. Um, and knowing that they've existed this long without that oversight is really, actually speaks to the role that they play in this city and part of the problem itself. Um, they're not effective and we know that they're disproportionately harmful to black and indigenous and people of color. We know this. Um, I was um, encouraged to hear uh, Paula mention Regis Kurczynski Paquette who yes 10 to 20 officers showed up to that call and her body lay uncovered in front of her friends and family and neighbors for more than five hours. Um, the response to that was, you know, also I, I did read the um, the Special Investigations Unit report on that, which showed that, you know, yes, this these these kind of, I, I don't want to be dramatic, but platitudes about how things need to be done about anti-Black uh, anti, uh, racism. And also, by the way, everything was done correctly. So what are we going to do about this? Um, I find it unnerving as well to hear that when we're building a budget, we're not thinking about taking money from somewhere and moving it somewhere else. I mean, maybe that's my ignorance about the way that money works, but I do find that unnerving. And even more unnerving, I, I find it to hear that, you know, this is something that we can't do. Well, if, if, so many people are here and calling for this. Um, my question is then, then what are the barriers and how can we address those barriers? If we have collective agreements, you know, it, how can we get together? Can we get a working group together and talk about how we can manage this problem? Um, how can we take some of the power away from this organization that has been so overpowered for so long? Um, reducing the budget of the police they are they are a, a fully functioning you know let's put it that way organization um, that has the ability to make decisions about how they spend their money um, so i i really don't understand why we can't move to defund the police and have them sort out where they make those changes um uh, finally um I, I, I am as well a health, a healthcare practitioner that really, really does not want to call the police when I need to. I have no other option at this time in certain 
circumstances. And, you know, I'm looking into the CAHOOTS model just really quickly while we're on this call. It does seem really great. I'm, I'm reading off their website. Uh, last year, out of roughly 24,000 CAHOOTS calls, police backup was requested only 150 times. And it's my understanding that with this pilot, a police officer will be involved in every call. Um, so, no, is that's not the no. case. Okay, well, no. I'm glad to hear about that. Um, it, and is it, it, it's not anything to do with the police at all? This, this, uh, this pilot project doesn't have, it's no, not, there was it's a not question. managed by the police? No, the idea is that, and, and we're, uh, that, that's part of the whole process here that they need to build, but they're working with community organizations that could be like the CAHOOTS model, uh, could administer these programs um, in the four pilot areas as we build the program out. So like there's still, the intention is it's, in fact, um, uh, Councillor Baila had a motion. The intention is that it is a non-police response first priority. That's, that's like the system of triaging. It is uh, non-police priority. Uh, to these calls. Now, somebody asked a question as well, and, and Gary was there, an executive, I was tuning in, but uh, something about, um, you know, would police, what, in what situations would trigger a police response? And uh, I, I forget the exact language they use, but if there was a, you know, a, some sort of threat or risk of violence or something that, you know, police would still be required. Um, but that, uh, that was the, the intention is that it's a non- and to, to your point, when you look at the numbers that come out of CAHOOTS, again, I know Eugene, Oregon is not Toronto, um, but that ratio of how many of these, these crisis calls can be responded and resolved without, uh, without police is certainly promising. Um, does anyone else, uh, Emma, feedback's very good. I'm just looking at the clock. Uh, Paula, yeah, did you I want just, to respond? I, yeah, I, I just want to say that you're right, Emma. The SIU, that's provincial. The police board, all the legislation is provincial. The, the two members uh, are put on the police board from the province or one member, I think it's one or two, are directly put on the police board from the province. So it's not just the city's police board. That becomes one of the issues. But what I want to just offer out is everybody was on this call. Brad and I can send out an email. You mentioned a working group. I think with the energy and attention that people want, what does a working group look like? Looking at the CAHOOTS model, looking at all of those things, looking at the budget as it exists, what kind of changes you want in order to get at it. If you want to work on that, Emma, if you can help spearhead that, I am very happy to pull people together that feel the same way you do that are on this call because there's a lot of folks here and get that started for next year and just in general. Very good. Thank you, Paula. And, and we're going to jump to our last question. Uh, Rob Hatton, I believe, uh, formerly of corporate finance, Rob Hatton. Uh, the big money guys the, on the call. Yeah, tuning hmm. in for the budget discussion. Great. That's right. Thank well, you. Good to see you, Rob. Around. Thank you so much for, for uh, having me here. Um, I know how, much, how many hours you guys put in. And so my comments, I'm trying to help uh, from my armchair here. So on three things, on transit, I don't see any effort to safely attract people back onto all those empty subway cars and streetcars. I know there's hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. And it seems to me things like conductors enforcing uh, masks, giving out masks, creating confidence in the safety of the system, and frankly, advertising the safety of the system. I think money spent there would earn you more back in, in transit ridership fares, maybe not immediately, but over time. And you're going to have to fight that battle to win people back. So I would encourage you to look at, make sure that that kind of activity is well-funded. The TTC, you can't leave it up to them. The fare revenue is being backfilled by tax dollars. So it's a tax issue from my point of view. Um, on housing, I know a lot of money goes into the affordability issue. But I think that giving grants to developers and even home buyers isn't working. It's just driving up prices. And you ask any economist, that's what they'll tell you. And frankly, if you ask any developer, that's why they love these programs. Um, an example would be first time home buyer rebates of land transfer tax for people who are buying houses that are worth more than your average taxpayer uh, assessment on your average home. 
Like, and that's going on and there's tens of millions of dollars there that could be easily reapplied to something more productive. Um, I don't even know, I know there was 400 million in exemptions roughly and rebates in 2018. I don't know how many there are in 2021. I don't know if you can even find out, but it's something that I think you could look at and find some money to do the things you wanna do. And then the, my third point, and uh, Councillor Fletcher already mentioned this, uh, Councillor Crawford, you'll remember the highway tolls and why they were stopped. And it was mostly complaints from regional chairs and in particular, the Durham chair. Now, now we're approving and paying for a super highway, right. six rail lines through our community. Why don't we defend our citizens the way that the Durham chair defended his and withhold our money until this goes underground. So those are my three comments. And I think they're actionable and I hope they could lead to something. Great comments, Rob, appreciate that. Good advice for us. Paula, did you want to- uh, Yeah, I have another motion coming, to, uh, coming as well about putting that <laughs> underground. I'm hoping to get your support, Brad and Gary, for that because uh, Rob's right. We can't just be destroying our city with our own dollars. I would love it, Rob. You know where all the money is. You've got great ideas. Uh, I'm really happy to hear this, um, where we should be looking for things. And uh, also, if you wanna be on the police budget working group, that would be great from the community standpoint. My own little editorial uh, of all the places that we want to put transit underground and overground, it's strange to me that that's the place that you want to go overground uh, of all the different places. But in any case, uh, maybe, uh, Gary, did you want to jump in there? No, or Rob, just taking, was, just I, basking in all the, the glory always, of this. Always appreciate your advice. And, and the TTC is looking at the whole public confidence thing. So they're working on that. And that was part of their tour report. So I've had conversations. That, that, and it's going to take time, of course, because that's the biggest thing. How do you get people back on the revenue side? Uh, again, I agree with a lot of the comments. Going back, here's our opportunity to really reimagine our relationships and partnerships with the other two levels of government. TTC is a big one. So when you're looking at where some wins can be, is looking at that relationship because those revenues aren't coming back next year. They're not going to, I think the, they're looking at three years from now getting up to about 80%, maybe, you know. So I think we have to reimagine and relook at those partnerships, which are underlying one of the more critical components of, um, of what we're doing. And Paul, if you move in that motion at council, I'll be supporting it. Um, Yay. Thank you. Very good. Look at everybody working together here in the East End. Okay, we will park it there, folks. I know there was a few folks, uh, just a handful of questions left. Uh, feel free to reach out to myself or uh, uh, Paula Fletcher, uh, Gary Crawford, any of us. We welcome your feedback. Literally get uh, hundreds and thousands of emails on, on this stuff. So uh, we do go through it, myself and my team and, and Paula and Gary and Steve. Uh, we're grateful for that feedback and, uh, and it's appreciated. Big thanks to Steve and City's finance team. Uh, you, you are the the unsung heroes of this budget, and in a year where it's been uh, it's been a bit of a show, uh, we're extremely grateful for your leadership and, and your diligence on this. Uh, and of course, to my colleagues and friends, uh, Paul Fletcher, Gary Crawford, uh, this is year three. Hey, Always a slice, lots of fun. And uh, most importantly, everyone who's been on the line and, and stuck into the late hours of the evening with us, I'm sorry it went over. I will try to talk less. Uh, the most important part is, is listening to you and, and, uh, and I really do appreciate you coming out here. Uh, Paula, Gary, any closing comments? No, just thanks everybody for coming out. And Brad, now it's time to put Briar to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Gary? Same thing. Thank you, everybody. Go be a dad now. And uh, as I said, it's really important for me as in my role just to be hearing everybody. Um, we always have difficult conversations and I invite and, and we need to have those difficult conversations. We're not always going to agree, but hopefully as we go through this democratic process, we, we fall, you know, somewhere, you know, in the middle sometimes. It may not always be what everybody wants, but we're always here to listen. And I think when we're looking at all of my colleagues, whether we agree and disagree on things, I think we do work, you know, collectively reasonably well. Um, and, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy, again, work with uh, my two colleagues, uh, Brad Bradford and Paula Fletcher. Um, and, and your input is incredibly important. And it's always nice to, to hear it. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Thanks. Good night. Good night.